Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 34 of Never Before Seen. My name is Amber Cyper, and I will be your host tonight as we bring you speedruns of games that have never before been seen in a mainline GDQ event. As always, if you happen to speedrun a game or category that has never been run in an AGDQ, SGDQ, or GDQX event, and you would like to submit it to the show, type exclamation point NBS into the chat to find the link to be able to send me your runs, and I would love to have you on board. So before we get started with the runs that we have planned, for tonight, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, first and foremost, um, One and done -a is coming up again where you can show off your favorite run and that's your only appearance in the One and, do one and done -a series. That is hard to say. <laughs> the second installment will be happening on August 13th through the 14th and submissions are open from right now until July 20th. Use exclamation mark o o -A -D -A -T, or ODAT. Um, <laughs> ODAT's my marathon. No, that's actually Amberlynn's marathon. In chat to find out more info and submit your run. Um, and secondly, we had a poll during the break. Uh, if you are watching live, you were able to participate in that poll. Otherwise, um, if you are watching on YouTube, check us out over on uh, gamesdonequick.com or twitch.tv slash gamesdonequick and you'd be able to participate in the Twitch chat poll uh, for any future shows. But Tonight on Never Before Seen, we are showcasing a couple of the runs that were on backup for Summer Games Done Quick 2022. And these are runs that were ready to go if needed in case of an emergency and ultimately went unused. And I like giving some of these runs a shot at being showcased as a bonus stream of sorts after the event. And the first run tonight has me joined by the wonderful Froob as he brings Lost Judgment, the Kaito Files DLC to the show for you all tonight. And afterwards, Puexel will be here to show off Legend of Mana HD Remaster to end in the, in the night and for now Fru, thank you so much for being here and how are you doing tonight yeah thank you very much for having me i'm doing pretty good although obviously it's very very hot tonight as it probably is in a couple of places so everyone needs to make sure you are staying hydrated of course yes um did you say english won the audio language yes english Fantastic. has won the language but uh not bid war language poll. <laughs> there we go would have been a bit war, but yes um so i guess we should just preface very very quickly and say that if you saw AGDQ 2022, yes, you may have seen Lost Judgment. Don't worry, this is the DLC. This is completely different. This is completely new. Um, the actual run in Japanese is faster by about five seconds at most, so it's not like it's that big of a loss. Um, but we'll probably play the final cutscene because it's only literally a minute long, um, so I can do my outro then. But yeah, this is Kite of Files. It's only an hour. It's not too bad. Uh, again, uh, for Judgment, the difference between simple and easy is simple gives you an auto combo. Easy is just without the auto combo, there's no other differences. So we're going to get going on easy, and when you're ready, I'm ready. Absolutely, so, feel free to count us down, because I am ready to enjoy this, honestly. Certainly. All right, then. Let's begin in three, two, one, go. So, Kaito Files is the first big piece of story DLC that RGG Studio have ever put out for essentially any of their like mainline Yaksa series, or obviously their side series, Judgment. The nice thing about this is that it's actually quite meaty. If you play this casually, it's about 10 hours long. For the speedrun, obviously, we're only going to take an hour, hopefully. We begin with a chase section rather than a tail section, which is what Lost Judgment starts off with. And as you can see, Kaito already has a couple of new tricks to these uh, chase sections, where instead of, you know, jumping over obstacles like Yagami would, instead he just barges right through them. And people as well, unfortunately, if they're in the way. Much like the Lost Judgment uh, run, every single every single QT on these segments are the same every single time, so I know what buttons are coming up. The nice thing is this is the only play section that there is in uh, Kaito Files DLC. There is a tail segment, which is about eight minutes long, usually. But the nice thing about Kaito Files is Unlike Lost Judgment, uh, it's normal any percent, which doesn't have too much in terms of like, like speed tech for time saves. Kaito Files has four big things. You will be seeing hopefully all of them. One of them, if I mess it up, will cost me a minute. The timing on it is exceptionally tight, but we will be going for it because I've been hitting way below my estimate a lot over the last day. But when we get to the end of our chase section, we're chasing a guy called Sender here. We're going to be going over to his agency. Uh, they've been trying to blackmail one of the Gender Law Office um, workers, and we are going to catch them in the act. But these guys are going to come back later. 
and we're going to get into, obviously, the combat. So if you remember Lost Judgment any percent, a lot of the combat was right. EX mode, but the nice thing about Kaito files is we don't use barely any of that. We use a little bit of it from time to time to upgrade our damage or to up our damage, but we don't actually use the EX mode as much as we did back in that run. Which I missed that guy with that hit, it's a shame. But you can see I'm basically using the default uh, style for Kaito, which is called Bruiser. And if you ever played Yakuza 0, you might recognize the actual hits themselves. Because the actual hits themselves might remind you of Kiryu's uh, Brawler style. Which, yes, it is very much like the Brawler style. Kaito is going to have two fighting styles. This is the first one. You'll get tutorialized on the second one very, very soon. Within the next, like, two minutes soon. But... His main actual fighting style is, as said, like Kiryu Zero's Brawler style. So Bruiser essentially will be chaining together a lot of really fast attacks, but Kaito also begins with a thing called Quick Step Cancel. This allows us to basically cancel out of any combo. Yagami here, who's the main anti-protagonist uh, for the uh, Judgment Games, he's gone off to fight a bear. I wish I was joking. I'm not. He's gone off to fight a bear. Don't worry about it. So Kaito's here. On the weekend, it's all, it's all him. It's, oh, he's on his own while Yagami's off in the mountains fighting bears. So, Kaito's trying to figure out who to go out drinking with. There's no one around, so we're just going to go ourselves. Now, Yagami, with the Judgment Games, gets a whole bunch of gadgets to be able to find stuff with. Kaito uses his senses, his senses of sight, smell, and sound. That might seem a little weird, but trust me, we're going to be using that sense of sound, uh, that sense of smell even, to find some underwear. Trust me on this one. What? So, uh, trust me, it's very <laughs> okay. good underwear. It increases my attack by 20%. It's very good. It's necessary. It's the best attack item we get in the run. Okay. So, the main plot's going to begin here. The guy on the right is our client. His name is Kyoya Sadamoto. For reasons that will be explained later, I call him Knife Daddy. You'll see why. Essentially, Kato got all dressed up. Here's Higashi in an apron. You want Higashi sighting of the actual run. And essentially what we need to do is Kyoya's come here. He wants us to take on a case of a missing person. This missing person is someone called Mikiko, who is supposedly his uh, wife. And the thing for Kaito is that Mikiko is his old girlfriend, who they were going to get married at one point. She has gone missing for quite a while. I'm going to go and buy a belt, because that's an important thing to pick up from a pharmacy. I don't know whether pharmacies usually stock belts, but here we are. So... And then I'm going to equip them and get my first upgrade, which should be quite simple. Boost attack. I don't think I need to explain boost attack, but boost attack, would you believe it? Boost my attack. Kind of surprising, I know. Imagine that. Yep. So it gives us it gives us a 5% attack boost whilst also not breaking the bank to be able to taxi. We're going to go to Higashi's Arcade Charles where there's some trouble brewing, and we're going to get our next fighting style. This is Tank. Again, fans of Yakuza Zero, you might recognize this one. This is Beast. This is Kiryu's Beast. But here's the better thing. Look at the end of that combo and notice the fact that Kaito doesn't throw the weapon away. This is a massive upgrade over Kiryu's Beast. This means that single-handed weapons are all of a sudden much, much more viable and much, much better. So the nice thing is you want to do your level up there because we're about to go back in time 16 years ago. We're going to go back to the 90s, you can tell, because Kaito is going through a Lincoln Park phase. You'll tell by his hair in a second. This is the aforementioned Mikiko. I'm not supposed to be smelling her yet. I'm supposed to be smelling the floor. She is trying to break the arm of one of, obviously, our fellow Yakuza's. We need to survey the scene, find out what's going on. There's a resume, there's a scared girl on the floor, and we need to use our nose on these box of sweets instead. So we need to show the box of sweets to show that she was here as a peace offering and she's angry because of obviously her blouse getting torn. That's it. A little misunderstanding. So Mikiko then comes and works for us to help pay off like a debt or something. And we're going to basically get another tutorial out fighting these drunks. Now this fight is a little bit of a shame because the only good weapon is this one and then all the others are quite far behind. I need to hit that guy with this bike because of all the damage that it does, as you can see. And again, still very much the same old Yakuza-esque heat styles. Or the heat attacks, I should say. That was actually not too bad of a fight. That's gone a lot better than it did earlier today, not gonna lie. But you can tell with Kaito's hair that it's the past he's got in his, his spiky punk rock phase. But we're gonna go back forward to the future where 
related to Kyrie, Kyrie's son turns up. But Kyrie's son says Kaito's his dad because he has reasons to believe that Kaito is actually his father with Mikiko. <laughs> it's trust me, it's gonna it's gonna make sense so, later. Okay. We're gonna head over to Cafe Alps. I'm gonna give a big warning right now. If you do not like bright white lights, look away from the screen because it does it twice. I don't like it, but unfortunately you can't skip it. Time to, to make say, this look away. really teeny for me. And you can look back. For some reason, the flashbacks, they don't remove the bright white light and it just flashes on screen, which is unfortunate. But I wanted to make sure I warned everybody. So we need to wake this guy up, but for some reason, he won't wake up when we yell at him. If we look with our, if we listen with our ears, we can hear that he's actually listening to music. If we take out his earphones, grab this of conveniently placed megaphone, and wake him up. So, we're going to skip through all the dialogue, and then we're going to get into our next fight. This fight is very specifically and quite random. We're hoping these two walk together. We're going to go to the right and grab that bike and do our next big level up. Okay, let's again, at least. I'm going to swim. Uh, they went and moved away, which is a shame. I'm going to grab myself a uh, Deadly Dance, and I forgot to grab myself, more importantly, attack level 2, which again should be self explanatory Deadly Dance, however, increases the damage that I do with weapons. I'm hoping Ooh. that he stays somewhat close by. Unfortunately, you really want them to be together to actually do damage to them. This guy is guarding everything. I don't want to take care of one of them too early, because the other one can use their EX move. EX moves are these moves that happen when a boss goes into like their low HP phase. Some of them you can skip like here, but when a boss or an enemy does their EX move, they are completely invulnerable. That's why we want to time the ending of the fight well to be able to not see the EX moves. Unfortunately here, we didn't have them go together. Usually they both go to the left and go next to the car and they get stuck. That fight spawn's not going to bother us. John has a phobia of knives, and this man has a knife, so unfortunately John passes out, and we're going to deal with both of these bugs. That's unfortunate. Usually he doesn't do that move, and because he did, I had to do another attack, because I could not go through it. This guy has a stun gun, so as long as we interrupt his attack, he won't hit us and stun us. But and John basically reveals he has a phobia of knives, because his old man, Kyria, um, when John found his knife collection years ago, decided to threaten him with it, which, that's really bad parenting, like, what the heck? So more importantly, we find an old friend of Mikiko's who says she's been around, but what we're gonna do is level up our nose and our smelling capabilities instead. Trust me, you're about to see why. We're gonna go over to Tenkaichi, over to the old Serena building. Oh, I told you there was a lot to explain at the start of this. We're gonna turn around. We're gonna go to Serena, and we're gonna sniff this dumpster, at which point we get a pair of boxers, 2,000 skill points, and that's what that's for. <laughs> trust, trust me, these boxes give 20% extra attack, they're fantastic. Now the nice thing is you'll always have a fight spawn here, but it always goes away because this is a area trigger. So an area trigger, you basically just have to walk in the area. Confirmation like the lady we're about to speak to, you can't be in a fight for. So, ugh. Anyway, getting near to the part where I don't have to commentate everything, but we're going to go to the roof. We're looking for Mikiko here. This was one of her favorite spots. We find this little kid asking for Mickey, but Mickey is actually their cat. So we're going to do the good thing, being, you know, a detective. We're going to go find the cat. We know exactly where the cat is if we go down to the basement level here. And we're going to go find the cat up on an awning here under the Millennium Tower. And to get the cat down, we do the one thing that we know how to do. We get the drone out. The drone is also good because it despawns enemies, which I might have to do in the next chapter if I'm unlucky. We get the drone down and the cleaning lady speaks to us and says that somebody else was here looking for Mikiko. Anyway, remember that guy we chased earlier on? He's back. He's back. He wants to fight again. Unfortunately, they take John away, so we're going to have to take care of these guys. I'm going to go into my EX to give me a bit of damage. Grab a two-handed weapon because two-handed weapons are really good, as you can see. Start swinging. And when I'm down to one hit left, I will hit Sender with the heat attack, because it does a lot of damage, as you can see. And now I'm going to focus on Sender to try and hopefully not have him use his EX attack. I'm going to move away so I don't get interrupted by a very long attack. The one you saw earlier, that's not too bad, despite his EX. If he does EX, you can just attack the other enemies like that. Now, you've seen at the top, right, and I mentioned this during Lost Judgment, there are certain parameters that you get for fight, finishing fights in certain ways. In Kaito Files, that unlocks moves, one of which can be kind of interesting later. We don't usually try and go for it, but one thing we can also do, ignore the smells, Kaito's going to do that now that we have an upgraded nose. 
one of the things we can do is these shining orbs, these are memories. These memories allow us to learn specific moves as well. That one gives us a thing called Gori Gori Finisher, which gives us a extra finishing attack on two of our combos, both of which we consider as launchers. Launchers are going to allow us to launch the enemy into the sky and continually try and juggle enemies. That's one of the strengths of Lost Judgment's combat for the DLC. You'll be seeing me do that a lot. And thankfully, we're going to our next, our uh, first big set piece, actually. And it might look familiar if you've ever played the original Judgment. This is a building called KJ Art. Basically, Sender and that lot have gone this way with John. It's an old Yakuza building from the original Judgment. There is a fight spawn, but it's going the other way, so I might not have to spawn this. Yep, good. Good luck. Very good luck. Now, if you remember Lost Judgment's any percent and me moaning about how bad the stealth sections were. Well, I'm about to show you why Kaito's stealth sections are the best. So we're going to be very careful not to get this guy's attention, because if I do, it's a game over. If you get anyone's attention in the stealth section, it's a game over. This bit has a, a couple of funky hitboxes, so I'm going to move to the left-hand side. Look at this door at a very weird angle. Look at this door. Listen to this door, because there's somebody on the other side. I'm going to end the investigation there. We used to grab some wristbands to the right there, but it's only 3% attack up, so I'm kind of considering not after silencing it earlier. Yeah, we open the door on this poor person. You'll see us open a door on somebody else real soon. Run in because there's a story trigger there. Run out, run up the stairs, and this is why Kaito's stealth is much better than Yagami's. Oh no, I've been caught. Game over, right? Nope. Not with Kaito. Kaito deals with things in the Kaito fashion. The downside is Kaito won't do this against the police. And that's actually a problem for the speedrun, as you'll see in a bit. But that does... We're going to sniff this door, by the way. Uh, that does give rise to cop skip, which, you, again, you'll see very soon. So we use that sense of smell to tell that somebody was behind this door having a cigarette. We can't skip the ones after the first one for some reason. This poor, this poor individual... I don't know how Kaito does stealth. I don't know how that's stealth, but that's stealth. We've got a... Oh, I forgot that bit right there. So Kaito just opened an invisible door. That's my fault. So in this bit, there's two doors where Kaito will try and open them despite them being opened. We'll listen to this door because someone is snoring on the other side. And this one because someone is actually just on this one. We're going to do our next big level up, and it's going to be the biggest level up we do of the run in a second, whilst also doing some equipment stuff. Lights out. That is with... certainly a way to approach stealth. Yeah. Oh, I did it again. So what you're supposed to do is you're not supposed to run forward, because then, if you run forward, you basically... Whoops, Daisy. Uh, you basically make it so that... Hold on a second. That's a reversal rage. So more reversals in our rage mode are better. Repel, which allows me to push back attacks and get an attack speed boost. Gory Gory Finisher, as we said, and Gripping Pile Driver, which, that's an infinite. You, you'll see. Oh, you will see. Now, one more enemy in here. Run to the left to not get put into that hiding spot. If you get put into any hiding spots, you have to do the actual hiding command where you grab a coin or you throw a coin and you have to wait for the animation of that to go through. So this is much faster. And now we have a boss fight. I promise. There's less explanation coming up. This DLC has a lot of explaining to do at the start. This is Photo the Killer. He's actually in the main Lost Judgment. I'm going to launch him into the sky. This is the Gori Gori. I'm going to double swap, and I'm going to juggle him with a specific combo. At this point, he's going to go into his EX. He is hyper arm here that I can't go through, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this combo early, dodge his mortal attack. I wanted to actually hit it, because it's actually worth getting hit. And then I'm going to, as you see, quick step cancel into my combo to take him out and hopefully have him stun locked long enough. You might be wondering why we only do the three hit uh, combo instead of the four hit combo. The four hit combo knocks your enemy to the ground and they will not be able to get back up for a while. So it's a lot harder to hit your moves and you won't be able to hit your strong attacks, which basically means that it's a lot slower to do the four hit combo than it is the three hit combo. Someone's spying on us. We're going to put on a disguise. We're going to just put on a hat, some glasses and a lovely cardigan. And then we're just going to leave. Even though he was right there watching us change our clothes. Don't ask about it. I don't know. <laughs> It's like, don't question it. It's how it works. He should see. 
He is looking right at us, but for some reason it works. I don't understand why. Anyway, we saved John. We're going to go meet him at the batting center, and then we're going to go back to our detective agency where we're going to have to go sniff our door. Again, it's important. <laughs> I could just imagine Kaito just going around, just sniffing every door in sight. <laughs> just, yeah, well, this smells like a cigarette. <laughs> well, that's the trouble with enhanced nose, is every so often you will hear a Kaito just like start sniffing. Like when we go past here, you also hear a cat. You'll see the cat on top of the vending machine. You can get a bunch of different cats in this DLC. They give you items. And the downside is they just don't give you good enough items for the run, obviously. So sniff the door and we'll figure out that that's not our cigarette. So, there's somebody in our office. <laughs> That's not our cigarette. Oh my god. <laughs> we have a particular brand, and Kaito knows it. So we're going to get out of the drone. Hope I can get to the right angle here into this window. Good. So, send us in our office again. We call the police, get him out, and then we finally get called back by the cleaning lady who remembers who was looking for Mikiko earlier, a guy called Yasutaka Shirakaba, a doctor who's living in a really remote part of Chiba. And that, whoop, if I can actually menu correctly, is the end of the second chapter. All right. <laughs> so that's the second of four chapters. The first two chapters are very fast in the speedrun. We get another flashback between, obviously, Kaito and Mikiko. Oops, a daisy. That's too early. We have to answer every answer here. The other two do not matter. But essentially, this is life. Kaito with Mikiko, you can see it see via the hair. Uh, just as their relationship broke down, because Kaito went to go do work for the Matsugane family, for the Tojo clan. He kind of regrets it. There's there's some regret. This is Shirakaba. Shirakaba is a doctor. I want you to remember that. He's a doctor. He's a doctor. <laughs> so, there's a bag. There's a picture of someone who looks very much like Mikiko, who has the bag in it, and the date from literally about two weeks ago. So she is very much not dead, as suspected. So they basically, here comes the big plot twist, where they faked her death because there were a, a group of people after her that were potentially Yakuza, but not Yakuza. And essentially, oh, that's all for now. Essentially, she wound up here with amnesia, temporary amnesia, got her memories back, and is now somewhere with her memories back. This is Nishio. We're going to get our last attack upgrade against Nishio, and our last upgrade for the run. It's an obvious joke. I'm not making it. Yeah. <laughs> so that hair is that wild, by the way. It's I one actually of the really things, like the color. It's one of the things that's really good about this DLC is because like you just don't see enemies with like or anyone with like hair like this in the RGG games at this point. But I'm gonna boost my EX a little bit to try and take care of some of these ants. Oh, that's unfortunate. But again, I'm just gonna ignore him. Oh, I wasn't. I went the wrong way, unfortunately. So he has a really long EX, you can see. I'm now gonna take my EX off whilst I try and deal with as many enemies as possible in a short space of time. Most enemies aren't grouped together, which is unfortunate for me. The larger HP enemies will just be using. Oh, you block for one attack. That's the unfortunate thing about the RNG is if they block your. Ooh, hello. If they block your strong attacks. That's the majority of your damage. So you really want this attack to be the one that hits, obviously. Ah, oh, shame I wasn't close enough. Not the best fight, unfortunately. And now, you see that lamp post that's there on the side? Imagine fighting yeah. somebody who can rip that entire thing out of the ground. This is Ken Mochi. Oh, we got his theme. Good. This theme can glitch out, and you get Hammerer's theme from Judgment, because it was the proto Ken Mochi theme. So I'm going to try and juggle him despite him holding that. Oh, I missed my timing, that's a shame, but it should be fine because this is good. I'm going to start doing my EX to do damage before he does his EX that I can dodge out of the way with. And then I'm going to try and get him before he does his EX. Good damage. These QTs are always the same. He's literally using that lamppost and swinging it with concrete on the end. Like... <laughs> The absurdity of this series has always made me, like, just enjoy watching these runs. It, it is fantastic. Ken Mochi is actually voiced in English. Uh, the guy is voiced by Crispin Freeman, which many people know from uh, Alucard from Helsing, for example. Uh, oh, yeah. Ken Mochi is voiced by Octopim. Ooh. Actual no joke. If you want absurdity, here's your absurdity. <laughs> Always. It's so good. It is so, so good. So, it really is. 
we get a little bit of conversation about whether Kaito has any feelings for Mikiko, which he still does. It's quite obvious. And we come back to Kamurocho to learn that, surprise, it's another day that ends in Y and Kamurocho is on fire. So we're going to go and see just who's dealing trouble with Kamurocho today. It's not the Akaza for once, it's Mikiko. We actually find her here trying to point a gun at someone. So we're going to go into this very, not really long set piece, but one of the bigger set pieces of this chapter. There's a couple of them, actually. We're going to start with the guy on the right because he has HP bar, and I would like for him to not do his EX move. This is good movement because he went this way. And I hit that guy. Uh, I would like for you to stop blocking. That was actually okay despite the block because I took the other guy out as well. Second for the first, first for the second. That'll make, that'll make sense soon. I'm just sniffing, don't mind me. So second floor for the <laughs> first time we're in here. Also, this is one of the best background tracks from Lost Judgment. Chat, if you've got any good jam emotes, now is a very good time. Kaito is known for drop kicks, by the way, which you two can do. That's your first official gun enemy of the DLC, but uh, he's gone down there and we're going to the roof. Because if I can do my combos well here, I'll be able to actually go much, much faster here. You want to be careful of walls and corners because they will bounce you off. I'm hoping to get a good angle on this guy to the right. Running square into one, two, strong. Good. Very good. That's really hard to get. The angle of that is actually very precise. I'm now going to head over here and I am going to be getting into my next fight where again I'm going to be trying something very precise. The one that bench to survive until the second half. This guy has a sword, but it's actually okay. No, he's going towards it. That's fine. If he's going towards it, we'll just do it the old-fashioned way. He's going to go into his EX real soon, which I don't want to see because I want to get these guys in first. They all have guns. This is why you want the bench for the second part of the fight is so that you can obviously kill them. So we're going to go into our EX. I'm going to go into tank. Oops, excuse me. I'm going to go into tank and I'm going to start swinging. The gun enemies aren't actually the ones you want to go for. It's actually that guy with the gun. And thankfully, I can go back to being this. I missed because of the height. Ugh. It's so fun to do <laughs> running dodge attacks, but I missed because of that small step. I wouldn't call that a small step, but... Not too bad, anyway, but the bench, you basically use the last hit of the bench as a heat attack on the guy, and it does a massive amount of damage. So Mikiko goes missing. She knows now we're after her. We get sent to the hospital because of smoke inhalation, and we're going to head out. We're going to tell Kyoya that, you know, we found Mikiko. He's going to head off for reasons, but essentially there's been a bunch of... There's been a bunch of killings of these people in this old Yakuza group, and essentially, we're trying to find out if it's Mikiko that's actually killing them or not, because it certainly looks like it is. So, this is going to be the hard set piece. This is going to be the bit that if I mess up, I lose a minute on. So, we're going to get into our next stealth section. If you remember, I may have briefly said earlier, Kaito doesn't punch cops, which is a massive shame. Because we have a set piece full of cops. So what we're going to do... Please turn the other way. Nope. He turned this way, so I've got to be a bit more careful because of that. Second for the first. First for the second. I'm on a very tight time schedule here. I have to not get seen by the police or I'm in trouble. So we're going to get seen by this policeman. Oh, he's turned around. That's perfect. So this is cop skip number one. Stand here. As soon as this one comes in, get around here. This stopped his animation and for him walking all the way down here. That saved us about 15 seconds... And this next one is even scarier. This next cop, his AI is set to only path when we get to this point here. So we now wait, and he's the guy we have to go past. I have tried so many times to get past that corner with this cop in front of us, and it's just impossible. The, it might be possible, but the angle is so disgustingly precise. Here's what I'm going to do, because this is very, very hard to pull off. We're going to go into the hiding point. This is good. This is very good. This makes him not see us, because we're technically hidden, and then we run around. Ooh, that was close. I can't tell you how hard it is to do that. It is actually very, very hard. This guy can also see us, but we're going to be a little cheeky. I'm, you have no idea how happy I am that I actually made that. Go past, you can run, go to the left to break his line of sight, and there we go. Whew. That's one of the hardest tricks in any Yakuza run. It's so hard to do. It's really That was precise. really cool. And I'm also laughing at, like, looking directly <laughs> down at you. is like, I don't see him. Yep. Yep. It's it's because it technically considers you to be in the hiding spot, so he can't see mm -hmm. you. His line of sight is technically broken. Anyway, Kaito has some of the best hearing in the world. He can hear this hard drive. 
as you do. I, I also can hear hard drives that are in PCs that are burnt. We're going to break this drawer with the crowbar we just got from back at the start of the room. Inside, we're going to find an iPad. Surprise. We're going to use the iPad. Oh, on 365. We're in. We're going to find a group called Rhizome on there with a group photo. We're going to cross-reference it with a list of the deceased so far. And surprise, they match. So things are starting to become a bit more clear. It seems as though Mikiko is going after revenge for these guys for something that they've done. We're going to send off Sasukubo, that good old friend, over in Izazaki Jincho, the hard drive. He's going to be able to hopefully get some stuff off. And now we get to the nasty part. Now we get to what every judgment runner hates, the tailing segments. For reference, OG judgment, um, it's any percent is four hours, 50 minutes by myself. Of those four hours, 50 minutes, 40 minutes, four zero, are tailing segments. This is a tailing segment. This one is eight minutes now. It should be. Right, but we actually go. have skips here. So I found the two cop skips, like, at the same time that a fellow runner and current world record holder for this, King Duncan, found these two tail skips. These are fantastic. So... We've always gone... I went on with Lost Judgment's Any Percent about how, with certain percentages, the enemy, we know what they're going to do. I know that Kenbochi isn't going to turn around until this corner, for example. He'll stop here, but he won't turn around just yet. So we're going to hide. But the nice thing is, with Kenbochi being at 0%, I know that he's not going to get any extra turnarounds, provided I don't leave my hiding spots early. So there's two factors in it. There's moving too far forward, and there's also the percentage of alert that your tail targets are. He won't turn around again because he's at 0%, and I know exactly when he's going to turn around at this point. Here's the first the first trigger point to get out of this tail segment, is when Kenmochi has gone a certain distance ahead, have to be careful of NPCs because they can make him turn around, and also if you bump into them, you make sound, and obviously that this is bad, this is bad, excuse me. <laughs> it's pretty bad, actually. Excuse because me, pardon that. me. Yeah, I, literally, if I walk into these NPCs, he will turn around. And that's going to make things a lot slower. Um, but essentially, we know when he's going to turn around. There's no skip for this bit, but the beautiful skips are going to begin with the bit after this bit. So you can hide behind either the boxes or the sign here. If you hide behind the sign, you can't see where Kenmochi goes. But if you go behind this box, you can literally wait until he goes over there by the Wild Jackson. Like, it's this is a really nice one. This is, like, nice and chill. The nice thing is, OG Judgment, when you had two people in a tail, with here is obviously Kenmochi and his lady friend. With those people in OG Judgment, both of them can see you. As you've seen most of the time, she's turned around a couple of times because he's NPCs and she hasn't seen me. The only person that matters is Kenmochi. Now, usually, his conal vision is quite high, but it won't be if he gets uh, predisposed of with story elements. Also, there's one of the cats you can collect. Let me just chill as we go by. Cats are good. Yeah. How you doing, bud? I'd have to be reasonably fast here. The um, the trigger point is just after he goes past the van, which is quite close. Obviously, the closer we get, the obviously the more he's going to turn around. There we go. You can see there. So we need to wait here for a second. This is tail skip number one. So if we move out early, he's going to turn around early. So I've got to wait quite late here. The red box you saw there was because he made it a certain distance to where he wanted to go. That is how the basis of all Judgment's tail segments work. I think I'm good here. Yep, as soon as he goes down here. So he's going to look at this crash on the left-hand side. I'm now going to run to the right because he's actually predisposed of, and I'm going to run straight here in the street, which is going to be weird because here's the next fight. This one, for some reason, isn't an area trigger like the rest of them are. It's an actual, it's just an area trigger. Like, it's, it is an actual area trigger. It's just, it's here. Okay, this is not going well, so I'm gonna throw that at you. As you do. And draw a slide kick into him. So that's tail segment number one. Now, I did get, oh yeah, you can't skip until the uh, scene changes here. I keep forgetting that. I did get seen a little bit here, which is a little unfortunate. I would have liked to have been zero. What am I right now? Four. I should be with a good bit of luck, 59. This looks like... Okay, that, look, uh, that, that looks weird. <laughs> Trust me on this one. We're hidden right now. I need, I need you to water. Trust me on this one. We are 100% hidden. <laughs> the game has just glitched a little bit. Don't worry about it. It happens every time you skip the cutscene. 
But essentially, we aren't crouched behind the car with John, who's doing a much better job of hiding than we are. We don't need to move just yet, because Kemochi is going to turn around, but he's going to turn around the second we lose sight of him there at the end of the street. We don't actually have to go that fast. See how we went down? There you go. But I don't have to go fast here. He's already turned around. There he is. And he's not going to turn around again. Now, the big tail segment skip is coming up after this. This one is even more fun, because remember, we're not supposed to be getting the attention of the person that we're tailing. This is a stealth section, after all. But we're going to do something a little different. So, there isn't a hiding spot here, but this is where the next area trigger appears. And this is how you do stealth skip number two. Hello. So uh, goodbye. We're just going to run, because again, the... Oh, that's red. That might cause one more turnaround, which is unfortunate. But this one, again, it's just as long as you get to the area, it's there. I'm glad I'm on tank still, so I can start swinging the bike. You want to go for, obviously, the guy with the large HP bar, if possible. So, I prefer not to use the heat attack, if possible. Oh, it's already gone, that's fine. We'll go back on to Bruiser, and we'll need to remember, thankfully he didn't use his EX. We need to remember that we're on Bruiser for the next fight, so it would be good if I can get off of Bruiser for the end of this fight, but I'm not going to. So I just need to remember for the start of the next fight that I need to change to tank. All right, got away from to go. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a wonderful cutscene. It's a wonderful cutscene sound. You you can't mistake it. So at sixty two percent, he might turn around one more time because of that early notice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait here for a very long time, an exceptionally long time, for him to pretty much go out of view over there. Now, I need to get the camera as close as I can to not being, like, obviously against the wall like that. He's going to turn around once just up ahead. We're not going to be able to see it at first unless this is, like, the best angle, which usually doesn't happen. Okay, he's going to turn around right now. Well, I'm not moving right now. Nope. And now we can move. But once again, just don't walk into people, don't walk into any, obje or any objects. <laughs> Can't speak tonight. This is usually not too hard. We do not have to run here. He's not going to go too far. The end of the tail segment is coming up up here. And he's actually going to turn around once more before we get there. But thankfully, he's going to do it, or he should do. I'm just going to be careful because of the red right there. See? Yes. We can start walking up next to here. Careful not to go too early because he can see you and walk down this entire road at you. I've had it glitch out like that. And as soon as we get here, go. Now it's time for our next set piece. Not too long, this set piece, but has some pretty cool fights. No self change tank. Yes. So Sender's here. Why is Sender here? We'll find that out in a sec. Change the tank, grab the plant, and hopefully get everybody with the swings. Almost a good fight if I turned around, but I didn't. We want to be tanked for the next one as well, which is important. Once again, we get to hear this amazing background theme. Not for long, unfortunately, but... Hello, Sender. Sender's here after Mikiko. Interesting. Everyone's after all of a sudden. Turn around. That heroic amulet, which gives us an attack buff, is 120,000 yen at Ebisu. So thankfully, we can get it for free. I'm going to run forward <laughs> and grab this before I equip it. Probably get rid of this guy first. I do not want him to go this way, so I'm going to start pushing him backwards towards this pathway. Go into my inventory and then equip it. So an extra 15% attack at the cost of 15% defense, I believe. Which is actually a problem for later. Too bad. Unfortunately, these two didn't get caught in the crossfire, which they usually do. Who's you? Also, for those wondering, the rappel hasn't gone off yet. You'll know when it goes off. Uh, most of the time, it doesn't actually go off in the run, but it's so nice to have just in case. And now it's time for our next boss fight. Because Mikiko is in here, and unfortunately, so is Ken Mochi. For some reason, Ken is under I don't know why. He looks very good. I'm jealous. So, we're going to attack extra extra damage. We're going to try and launch Ken Mochi. This is a not great position for him to be going in. This is a better angle, though. That's not. We do not want him to go in the hot tub. We just don't want to go in the hot tub at all because it's so infuriating to try and attack Ken Mochi in the hot tub. Oh, no. I did not want to get hit. He's biting my arm. Could you, could you stop, Ken Mochi? Ah, the X for that. There's the attack. So what, look at how much attack like speed I have now. This enables me to do this as well. Oh my goodness. Oh, you can repel that? Wow. I never even realized. 
not the best fight. Anyway, <laughs> IGG are known for their over-the-top QTEs, so I hope you'll enjoy this one coming up. This is one of my favorite QTEs that RGG have ever put out. It's so good. Like, this entire set of movies, like, RGG love their choreography and they love the show off. See, now we go in the hot tub. And then we just square off. We just square <laughs> off for like half a second. It's so good. It's just so good. Triple square into a triangle. Not too bad. Not too bad. That's the end of Kenmochi, and we finally get to meet back up with Mikiko after all these years. So, there's going to be a big load of plot dump that's going to happen at the start of this chapter that I do not have the time to be able to fully describe. But basically, Mikiko is taking out the members of this old group uh, because the leader of their group, I can't remember the exact reasons why, but he's a massive, massive nasty person, and we'll find out who that is real soon. But the amnesia was real. Obviously, everything was real. John's real dad, it isn't us. It is Koya, which is very unfortunate. <laughs> so, whilst she goes and rests in the other room, we're going to give a conversation to others. And as you'll notice at the window, yeah, she's gone again. Here's Igarashi and Sender. We're going to get into a fight with them. I'm going to move forward, try and get this up. Oh, vase with tank, good. Because this is good damage if you can get this. Both of them have an EX, so we really want to hopefully... Ooh, good job. Hopefully stop their EXs. And you will probably see me start to use the Pile Driver combo. So the Pile Driver combo, as you can see, is an infinite. Oh my god. I should have seen I was going to get hit by that. I'm going to stop you. I want to get Sender before he does his thing. How did that not do the thing? Because I connected with a strong attack. Bizarre. Oh, I guess it was because of the back attack. That makes sense. But hopefully I can stop Igarashi's EX by keeping him completely locked down the Power Driver. Now, the Power Driver isn't a true infinite. There are ways for the enemy to get out of it, and usually Sender does, but Sender behaved today, actually. Um, you'll see the Power Driver in full action with the final boss of this run. Uh, there's a couple of bosses where the Power Driver is very bad at, because those bosses will either delay their wake-up or they'll wake up into an attack that has hyper armor, which is what the penultimate boss is going to do, and what Kenmochi actually does as well. Kenmochi isn't... Kenmochi sometimes is good for power driving, because sometimes isn't. If a boss... It, it, I'm, I'm afraid so, Cat. I do apologize. But basically, if a boss delays getting up off the floor, you have to go into a longer combo, but it's usually pretty obvious when that's going to happen. You have enough time to react to it. And with this, we're going to get to the point of no return. So there's only four chapters. We're going to get a text from Shirakabo, the doctor, who says, you find Mikiko. And he's like, maybe we should go and have a talk, because Shirakabo kind of has feelings for Mikiko. Yagami's going to finally call us back. He stopped fighting a bear. Instead, he started chasing people on swan boats, and he's going to be back tomorrow. So Yagami's little obvious get him out of the DLC excuse is now done. We're going to speak to Sender, who we're now on good terms with, question mark. And we're going to go and go over to Izezaki Ajincho, which, if you know from Lost Judgment, is the other map you can go to. But it's the final set piece. And I'm actually kind of surprised. So the reason why the building was set on fire was to destroy evidence. It wasn't Mikiko. Here's the burnt hard drive. And the person who's orchestrated all this is the father. Kyoya Sadamoto, a.k.a. AKA Mikiko's husband, a.k.a. Knife Daddy. Essentially, he's actually the person that killed uh, Mikiko's family in an arson, quotation marks, accident. So he's not a nice person, so we're going to go and deal with him, but unfortunately, Mikiko has come here to kill him. He's been killing all the other members of the group before she could get to them, even though she's been the one that wants to obviously kill them. So for this speed tech, we're going to wait here and wait for this waiter to come by. Hopefully not too close so that we don't get into a cutscene. Speak to him, and now we have to find a way to get into the bar to the, the uh, waiter's uniform. So to do that, we're going to go backwards real quick, and we're going to go to the bathroom. It makes sense. Trust me. We're not going to go. There's been a lot of trust here. this run, and I'm Just willing sorry. to keep trusting. <laughs> <laughs> there is a key in here. Somebody dropped a key for Let's some reason see. in the bathroom. As you do. There's only ten minutes left of this run, by the way. Hopefully you've all have enjoyed it. Like this is our this is one of our quickest uh, runs for RGG games alongside Majima Saga. 
It's really, really quick at less than an hour. It's it's good fun. It's very good fun. I'm actually on PB pace right now, which is kind of surprising. Ooh, this right here. So we're going to go out here. And again, if you're a fan of original Judgment or Lost Judgment, you're going to recognize this guy. It's poor old Tashiro. Now, this bit is quicker in Japanese because you can skip this intro. So this is the main reason why Japanese is quicker. But yep, there's our old friend Tashiro. We're going to use this fight to build up EX. So I'm going to launch him. Double swap to be able to combo him again. Not what I want to do, but it's fine. It works if he doesn't do his EX. Whoops, that's my bad. I did not mean to count on that one. Oh, you would you would stop me there, wouldn't you? Every time. Again, you don't want your strong attacks blocked. Your strong attacks getting blocked is the, ma the majority of damage at this point. It's a shame. So... Once again, much like Judgment, we're stealing Tashiro's clothes. I'm sorry, Tashiro. <laughs> Once again. And now we're going to go into the party. And I'm not going to forget, because I always forget. I'm going to speak to uh, this lady here, and then the unfortunately named friend of lady. This, this poor lass didn't get that much of a, a good role in this game, unfortunately. Wait, her name is actually friend of lady? Yes, or it is. Or friend of, like, oh my yep. god. Yep. <laughs> So we go to the toilet and find somebody passed out. Mikiko's already here. Kyoya is supposedly not here. He is. We're going to take down Nishio again. I'm going to start by going into my EX for extra damage. I'm going to launch him. Unfortunate timing on my part. They're both in the corner, so I'm going to do this. Now, if we're in our EX, we can actually quick step cancel out of um, doing that really long combo. Like this, which is good. Good fight, actually. And again, <laughs> he just doesn't learn his lesson. I mean, look, with hair that powerful, like, I too color coordinate my hair with my pants. He's got all the power in the world. Of course, he's going to fight you twice. It's true. True. It's very true. Please don't use your EX. There's actually two enemies in this fight that can use their EX. This is the other guy, unsurprisingly. Thankfully, he didn't hit me with it. <laughs> oh, you already had to guard that. They are really guarding all my strong attacks today. It's unfortunate. This should finish. Unless he guards, of course. Thank you for the speed. <laughs> and again. You keep giving me attack speed. I Again, I agree with that SP point at the top right. I fully agree with that. Thank you very much, video game. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say those words with video games, is it? We're going to head upstairs and we're going to get into another fight. We're going to aim for the guy on the right because, again, as you can probably guess, large HP, which equals an EX move. I'm going to actually go into my EX for the extra damage. Launch from the sky. Keep him in the sky. The juggling is so satisfying. Now, unfortunately, even though you can juggle almost infinitely, look at how little damage I'm doing. You have to actually let your enemies down from being juggled at some point. Otherwise, you stop doing damage. Nice double hit, actually. Not too bad. Sender actually helping for once. Incredible. That really doesn't happen very often. That's really nice. So we're going to head down this corridor. It's a very small corridor, as you can see. And unfortunately, there's a bunch of guys in front of me. And again, it's a small corridor. So we're going to do our full combo to try and obviously hit as many as we can. I'm going to go into my EX now. And we're going to try and hit as many enemies as possible and take them out. I'm gone. I need you to stop using that gun now. Obviously, there's a large HP barred enemy. We're going to try taking him out now because I'm doing pretty good on damaging multiple enemies. I had a feeling that guy was going to get in the way, but actually, it wasn't that bad, although it was now. That should have hit him on the ground. I'm upset about that. <laughs> I really should have dealt with the gun enemy first because gun enemies are bad. Essentially, whenever we do Yakuza runs or obviously RGG runs, the usual train of thought is that gun enemies equal bad and you must get rid of them. They do a lot of damage in this game. Um, they're not as bad as they are in OG Judgment, but they do... We don't have any HP upgrades. A gun attack is going to get rid of about a quarter of our HP bar. So we do want to get rid of them. Wait here until this transition and then we go. So once again, stealth section. You'll never guess what I'm about to do. Good stealth. Look at this impeccable stealth. This is the best stealth I've ever done in any video game. <laughs> now, the nice thing is you'll see, it's going to put our HP down very, very low to one. But these opening cutscenes can't kill us. If we fail the QTE, we will die. Uh, excuse me. I don't know I was holding the button. But thankfully, 
Obviously, we can just do this. Now, I did forget to do something earlier, which was shortcut a healing item, because obviously, I'm not going into the next room at 1 HP. The downside to Kaito's EX is that it doesn't have immortality, unlike Yagami's, which you can learn. So I'm going to learn that. I could learn a skill that gives me more damage when I go into EX in red HP, but as you can probably guess, man has a gun. I'd rather not. He'll one hit kill me. So yeah, you don't you don't take your fists into a gunfight no. with one HP, or you know take your tables into a gunfight with one HP. <laughs> yep. You can probably guess what we do here. There's going to be backups for the enemy. Now, unfortunately, I have taken out most of the chairs on the side, which is a shame. These chairs are really good attacks. Usually they wouldn't be. But because Kaito doesn't throw the chair, unlike Kiryu's beast, they're really good. So I'm just going to keep swinging. That's my plan. Ow, see that damage? Thanks, that buddy. damage is absurd. Would have appreciated not taking that damage, but sure. This will be the last set of enemies. So again, we got three main enemies and obviously a bunch of normal enemies, all of which get taken out very quickly with the actual spread of this. I would rather not get hit by that, and I do want another chair. Chairs again are very good, surprisingly. You would think the two, because usually it's two-handed weapons. Usually it's two-handed weapons that are very, very good. But nope, here it is these chairs. The actual spread of obviously damage. I'm gonna hit him with this because it's faster and does good damage. And I can change to Bruiser for the next fight. Not too bad. Less than half HP might be a little dangerous, but we'll find out. So it's time to go and confront Koya. AKA Knife Daddy. Again, you'll see why he's called Knife Daddy in about 20 seconds. <laughs> you can probably guess why. So when we get to the roof, we're gonna see a standoff between Mikiko, obviously Koya. John is here, so is Ken Mochi. Ken Mochi, my beloved. We're gonna obviously give him all the info, and then something bad's gonna happen, and uh, lots of people are gonna die. And Kyoya's gonna live, and we're going to have to fight Kyoya. Oops, excuse me. I always make mistakes in my it's cutscene skipping, it's the worst. And of course, with, you know, most of your usual RGG final bosses, you get a lovely dynamic intro. Oh yeah, that is definitely, that. that is Knife Daddy. Yup. He has a lot of them. Thankfully he only uses one in the fight. But the downside is, is his knife is coated with poison. The reason why they show you this cutscene is because... Probably Knife Daddy knows how to use the knife. And unfortunately, he's cut Kaido. So, time to take out Knife Daddy. So... I'm going to start by doing a normal combo so he doesn't get a chance to react because he has been lately, which has been really frustrating for me. That's not the style I want. That's why. Oh, that's not good. I... Am I going to do something real good? I might actually. Do I have it? Please tell me I have it. I don't. Okay. So basically, I did not do enough uh, of this uh, special ending of a fight called Era Supremacy, which would have given me a special skill, which would have increased my attack when we get to... Use EX at this low HP, as I said earlier. I'm actually in trouble if I'm not careful here because this fight is really bad. Hmm, very bad phase one. So, QV is always going to be XX. I have enough to do one full combo before he is a problem. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a light strong so I know my timing for this next bit. And then just do a full triangle EX move because we can do that with the right timing. There we go. I'm now going to heal because I don't trust this right now. Yeah, it's probably to a try. good call. That's a bad idea. I shouldn't have done. You should not do the. You should not do the um. Uh, the thing against him, the power driver infinite, because that is what he does to get up. But unfortunately, he actually didn't do it this time. Launching him is good though. And there we go. That is Ooh. Knife Daddy, which, I mean, with a fight like that, usually you'd think that'd be the final boss. But I haven't called time yet, because the courier isn't the final boss. Amazingly enough, there is one more boss, because Mikiko, in the in the aftermath of what's happened, Kai's been in the hospital for a while, and Mikiko has gone back to Shurikaba. And of course, Shurikaba plans to actually try and engage with Mikiko. 
Kaito, who has been conflicted until this point, knows that he wants to take Mikiko home, which leads to this. This is a doctor. This man has worked out. So, this is hopefully him behaving and you seeing the infinite. He's gonna get up very, very aggressively, which is gonna enable us to just do this. Phase one is gonna consist of us building up our EX. <laughs> This is it! This is your final boss, folks. We'll let you know when time is. Hey, look, 1 HP. About that. He's a doctor. He gets a self heal. All of his what? HP. Oh my god. But he's also still susceptible to the infant. <laughs> Yeah, you'd think that would be not the case after the self-heal. After you go no. into the last phase, but nah. He's actually behaving really nicely today. This is good. So there's going to be four QTEs coming up, and the time is on the last QTE. Here we go. First is triangle. <laughs> Couldn't put it better myself. <laughs> then square. And square again. And finally, triangle. So, time is coming up on this QTE. Time. I literally PB'd by a second. <laughs> wow. Wow. GG's. Everyone get think, your GG's out for Froob. I didn't think I was after Knife Daddy. Knife Daddy was bad. Knife Daddy Phase 1 and 2 were pretty bad. That's That would usually cost you a PB, but actually everything else that happened around it was pretty good. Shirakaba actually behaved. Shirakaba doesn't usually behave that well. Usually he will delay his wake up, which again, you can tell because he'll just stay on the floor when your third hit is coming out. So at that point, what I usually do is either do the free hit combo and then launch him with the kick, or just wait. So... Frankly, this ending is only like 60 seconds long as well, so thank you all very much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed. Thank you, Amber, for having me on. I very, very much appreciate it. Absolutely. It was my pleasure to have you here. And what happened to, like, yeah, the very beginning has a lot to talk about, and then it'll be fine. And then <laughs> constant amazing commentary the whole way through. That's me, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, hey, look, you'd rather over-deliver on good commentary than under-deliver on it. I don't know how to stop talking, and that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's a relatable one, honestly. <laughs> but oh, no, seriously, yeah. thank you so much for agreeing to do this, because I know it is very late where you are uh, right 21 a.m. Or maybe it's very <laughs> early where you are right now, <laughs> depending on how you feel about it. But no, thank you so much um, for being part of this and uh, for uh, answering when I reached out to you for the uh, for the run because I saw you on the backup list and I was like, oh heck yes! Like fruit is amazing. Yeah, so, thank you very much for considering me. I appreciate it. Um, absolutely. And I guess there's like a little wrap up for those who don't know. Uh, I was actually at physically at SGDQ uh, two weeks ago at this point. Uh, where I did a run of Yakuza Like a Dragon. You can also find that on uh, GDQ's YouTube, um, which that run went very, very well. That run went amazingly well. Ignore the karaoke at the end of it. Didn't happen. A fever dream. <laughs> I saw clips of that and saw that it ended with never, never make me do this again. <laughs> <laughs> it's the <a> charity. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gotta always a good cause. <laughs> but no, seriously, this this was really enjoyable. You always make uh, you always find a way to break these runs down into something that is easily digestible by someone who has never played the game um, or has never seen the game in my case. So thank you again uh, for doing that. Yeah, thank you very and, much for having uh, me. Where can people find you, by the way? Before I before I uh, introduce the next run or like you know introduce the break. Certainly, uh, I'm Twitch.tv slash Prove. As you can probably guess, running an RGG game. I run all the RGG games currently, bar the two PSP Yakuza's, which I do own physically. And the plan is to hopefully do these this year. But I need an actual PSP 2000 slash 3000 to capture them, and something like a retro tink to be able to capture them as well. On top of that. Um, but I do all the Yakuza runs, um, I think I'm doing five tomorrow, so 
If you like Yaxa, if you want to see Yaxa speedruns or you're just interested in RGG speedruns, yeah. Thumbs up. Heck yeah. All right. So, that being said, it is time for our break. Um, coming up next is going to be Puexel coming on with the Legend of Mana HD Remaster. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to El Ep episode episode 34 of Never Before Seen. My name is Amber Cyprin. I'm going to be your host for this next run coming up. And I am joined by the wonderful Puexel, who is going to be doing Legend of Mana HD remaster. And uh, the results of the poll are in. We're going to be doing the Dragon storyline. Uh, so thank you all so much for voting in that poll. And if you are watching on YouTube and you're interested in voting in these polls uh, on any shows that have them, consider checking us out over on gamesdonequick.com or twitch.tv slash gamesdonequick. Uh, NB, uh, NBS specifically is every other Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. So I've been looking forward to this for the last week or so, and I hope you all have been too. Uh, Puexel, how are you doing? Thank you for joining me so late in the evening. Oh, my pleasure. I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. That last run was amazing, and I'm looking forward to this one. All right, we go ahead. Are we ready to get started then? Absolutely. Feel free to count us down. And uh, I think if you don't mind opening with uh, what the difference is between dragon and fairy storylines other than a 10 minute estimate, uh, I'd be very interested to hear that. Uh, sure. Well, there's a, there's a bit of a cutscene before we actually get going. So let me just go ahead and get started and then I'll, uh, I'll go over that as we get going. So then uh, timing will start after I confirm my map. So let me just go ahead and uh, pick English so I can actually read the stuff. Like my starting weapon of the hammer. This will do, uh. We'll do NBS for our hero name tonight for Never Before Heck Yeah. Seen. All right, so countdown, five, four, three, two, one, go. All right, so it's my pleasure tonight to do a run of what I consider to be one of the most gorgeous looking and sounding um, action RPGs ever made, Legend of Mana, which was uh, originally um, released on the PlayStation 1 in North America in the year 2000 by Squaresoft, now Square Enix. And I'm playing the HD remaster on PC, which came out last year on PC, uh, PS4, and Switch. Um, this is the fourth game in Square Enix's Mana series. Um, although this game is actually pretty different from the three games that came before it in the series. Um, the th previous three are kind of more traditional, um, story-driven, linear JRPGs, but this game is more of an open-world style game where you you kind of you build your own world map through, um, through what are called artifacts that uh, we'll be talking a lot about as the run goes on. And then um, rather than kind of having a long, continuous uh, story, uh, this game focuses more on kind of shorter stories and quests that we like to call events. And um, the goal, in order to finish the game, there's there's two things that need to happen. One is that we need to place 18 artifacts on our, on our world. And then the other is that we need to finish one of three major story arcs, because there's 68 total events in the game, and then about maybe a third or so of them fall into one of three main story arcs. And those are the Dragon storyline, the Fairy storyline, and the Jumi storyline. And then um, for the um, shorter speedrun categories for this game, they're defined by which of the major story arcs um, we complete in order to fulfill one of those requirements to uh, be able to start the end game. But we're going to be doing the Dragon storyline tonight, which is actually the shortest of the three. It's about um, 10 minutes uh, on average shorter than Fairy storyline. So we're getting started here, just heading out of our house and then talking to this um, plant-like creature called a uh, Sproutling, who gives us our first artifact, the color blocks. Like I said, this, we get to build our own world in this game, and um, we get we get art we get we kind of just got our first artifact given to us um, for 
for just starting, basically. But most of the rest of them are either given to us um, for completing quests or uh, or through exploration. So, and then um, artifacts can create either towns or dungeon type areas. And then the color blocks gives us uh, the town of Domina, our first town area. And there's two artifacts um, that we can get here for, um, for for getting our first dungeons. Uh, we'll eventually be getting both of them, but uh, for for this particular run, I'm just going to be getting um, one of them right now, and then coming back for the other one later. So we play as a silent protagonist um, that uh, isn't kind of directly involved in any of the um, quests that we get involved with, but um, he or she meets a number of um, ally characters as you go. And we just met uh, Niccolo, who's a merchant rabbit, because there's, there's, this, this world does have a lot of demi-human races in it. And he's asking us to help him uh, del deliver some goods to, on a highway that's currently overrun by bandits. I am loving this uh, OST and the art style so far. Yeah, I wasn't kidding when I said that this is one of the most gorgeous looking and sounding uh, RPGs ever made, too. Like, I just I just absolutely love the hand-drawn uh, background art and then the uh, kind of late... 2D generation uh, sprite work too, and then it's got a phenomenal soundtrack by Yoko Shimomura, who's kind of better known these days for uh, the Kingdom Hearts series and uh, mm -hmm. a number of other things like that. So I had noticed right. that the before before you called time, you had selected a area to play in. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that? Because I actually don't know anything about um, Legend of Ma Mana's mechanics. Sure. I guess now is... Um, well, let me... let Because me, we're about to do some combat, so let me just sure. kind of explain the combat mechanics, and then uh, when I get a chance after that, we'll talk about some more about the uh, world-building mechanics, just because both of those are really important as far as the speedrun routing. All right, so... Um, got her kind of... Got our first taste of combat here. Um, I picked the hammer type weapon at the start. Um, it's, it's not the weapon I'm going to be using for the whole run. Eventually, I'll be using sword type weapons as well. But um, between the. Because um, the, the weapon you have get, affects your stat growth as you level up, along with which special attack you start the game with. And then the uh, strength growth from the hammer, and then the blammo special attack that I get. Um, are both uh, pretty optimal for the uh, for this first dungeon area, Luan Highway, for um, uh, for for the route. And then um, you're, you're seeing a lot of me using a uh, using this spin attack, which I actually didn't even know about playing the game casually. It wasn't until I started learning the speed run that I learned that um, when you equip the spin ability and then use a um, hit the attack button to you actually do a spin attack. And um, that's really useful for normal mob fights in this game because there aren't really a lot of attacks in this game that can hit multiple enemies at the same time. So using spin like this, and like here I'm hitting all three of the enemies at the same time, that in the end, even though spin isn't like a, one of the more damaging attacks, I can use the fact that I can hit two or three enemies at the same time um, translates into uh, a lot of faster mob fights. And then um, using the spin is actually fairly technical too, because um, you may so there are some cases where you might see yellow stars popping up over enemy heads when I use the spin. Um, that means that there's a chance that, that I might um, dizzy them, which is which is actually the primary purpose of spin. But um, if I do it too many times in the same fight, I may get dizzied myself. But um, kind of the the ranges for spinning or um, doing damage and getting those yellow stars is actually different. So you can kind of thread the needle, basically, to um, to hit multiple enemies with your spin, but not risk dizzying yourself. And uh, but yeah, so that takes a fair bit of practice in order to be able to do uh, kind of somewhat reliably. So we've got our first boss fight here, who's kind of, I guess, the kind of the leader of the bandits that are uh, terrorizing the highway, Mantisant. Uh, if anybody's played Secret of Mana out there, 
they may recognize Mantis Ant as being the first boss in that game, and I guess now he's making a cameo in uh, this one as well. That was actually a pretty good fight, because um, uh, you saw me using my Blamo special attack um, on some preceding fights. Uh, pretty much every boss in this game has their own series of special attacks, and whenever they use them, they're invincible for the uh, charge-up for it and while they're doing it. So being able to kill Mantis Ant... Uh, um, without seeing uh, kind of a wind slash attack that that it can use is pretty good. All right, so we've we finished our first our first event, Niccolo's Business Unusual, and he's giving us a couple of a uh, couple of rewards, which are just some items that aren't really too relevant for this category, and then two more artifacts. So I guess back to talking about the overworld and artifacts. Um, there's a really important mechanic when we're building our world called land levels. And um, the reason that's important is that when we um, put down an artifact to create a land, it gets a level assigned to it. And if it's a town, that level affects what kinds of equipment we can buy at the weapon shop in that town. And if it's a, uh, um, if it's a dungeon area, then the land level affects the stats for the monsters and bosses that we fight there. So the, a lot of the routing for um, speedruns is kind of optimizing those land levels so that, um, um, in particular with dungeons, um, when we have dungeons that have a lot of combat in them, that the enemies have as little health as possible. And then the, the, the kind of the square of the, of the larger world map of Fadil that we pick for, for our gameplay area kind of ties into that too, just because... Um, each piece of it has uh, that we can actually play the game on has some um, water tiles in it, and we just kind of want to ensure that um, the water tiles aren't going to get in the way of being able to kind of build our world map the way we need it to in order to uh, get the right land levels for the areas that we need to go to as part of the run. All right, so now we're, we head we headed back to Domina, and then. Um, picked up the second um, kind of intro dungeon artifact called the Jade Egg here. And, and now we're doing what's, what's kind of initially a side quest, but is eventually going to be a required, uh, kind of just a ties into a requirement for the Dragon storyline. And that's um, this quest called Monster Corral, which we need to do in order to activate the, this game's pet system. I'm down for pets. There are great pets. Pets yep. are good. Ah, I got, 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 in order to yeah, because in order to in order to activate the pet system, we need to uh, catch this uh, monster egg here, and we we put down uh, tasty uh, fruit and veggies in order to um, kind of bait it to uh, chow down on those, and then we capture it. And uh, I, I I was I felt like I was on pace for a uh, pretty fast catch here, but then it the egg I guess just decided it wasn't hangry enough to. Uh, to want that delicious uh, bell, bellflower uh, vegetable there and just walked away. So, so yeah, unfortunately, it's a bit of a time loss. But, uh, but um, not, the backup plan is just to kind of hang out in this corner here because uh, if, I, if, if I get too close to the egg, um, it, it, it basically gets scared and runs away and loses interest in the food. So I'm just kind of hanging out as... Uh, as far away as I can, and then just waiting for the egg to decide uh, that it's got the munchies. Come on, egg. It's got really, really <laughs> just trolling right now. <laughs> yeah, got a tasty, uh, got a tasty treat waiting for you right there. It's like, nah, I'm good. Yeah, I see. That there's a couple other. Uh, members of the Legend of Mana community in chat that are uh, definitely feeling my pain right now with this egg, just not cooperating, because uh, <laughs> if, 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 if it went perfectly, this would have been over in about five to ten seconds. I would have just put down the fruit, walked, kind of ran past it, the egg would have eaten it, and then I would have caught it, and we'd be done by now. Yeah, this is, this is getting pretty uh, silly, too, as far as just how... Uh, Okay, there we go. As far as how obstinate this egg is getting, but uh, anyway, so um, so yeah, like I said, this is a um, 
this is a mini game that um, you can do more of if you want, but we're just we're just doing it once as part of the Monster Corral quest. Because um, in addition to having kind of story-driven ally characters like Niccolo in the previous quest, and now this guy named El Azul here, you can also have pets that you can just kind of you can raise on your ranch near your house and then. Um, feed them uh, food to uh, raise their stats and then take them with you for uh, combat and dungeons. Um, and there's actually a quest that's part of the dragon storyline that we need a pet for. And even though we're not actually going to be using the pet rabbi that we, um, that, we, uh, that we got from that, we have to do the tutorial to get any kind of pet at all. All right, so now that that's out of the way, since we um, we picked up Elazul back in Domina, now we're going to go into uh, McKeev Caverns here and then start the Lost Princess, which is the other uh, kind of introductory dungeon exploration quest. This quest also gives us a little bit of a taste of the Yumi storyline too, because uh, El Azul and then uh, another character that we'll be seeing shortly, Pearl, um, are really important characters in the Yumi storyline. But uh, this is this is all we're going to see of them in the Dragon storyline run. Right, so again, I'm uh, trying to kind of thread the needle with where I'm standing when I do these spin attacks, that I'm hitting both of those mushrooms without um, triggering the yellow stars over their heads, which happens if I get too close to them. And uh, if, the reason that, I, that that's bad, even though it means I have a chance to um, briefly stun the enemies, is that uh, um, there's a chance that I get stunned instead. And th that's really bad, as you might expect in a speed run if I'm just unable to move or do anything for about like five seconds or so. Yeah, I'm seeing some love for the music and chat. And it, 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 uh, it, 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 gets, it gets better from here. I mean, pretty much every bit of this game's soundtrack is a banger in my opinion. Fukushima Mura did some of the best work of her career in this game. You'll also be noticing that I'm pick I'm basically just trying to pick up everything dropped by enemies too, because whenever I finish a fight, um, the, the I don't actually get the results screen until I've collected all of the drops from the enemies. Enemies can drop um, experience and or money items or healing items, and I have to either pick up all of those or wait for um, them to naturally despawn before the fight actually ends. And it's generally faster to pick them up. Okay, so this is our this is doing the boss of uh, of this quest. I really love the sprite work for this uh, boss too. This uh, giant yeah, yeti. Yeah, the sprite work's delightful. And um, we, you just saw it, it used one of its own special attacks where it did some frost breath, and then since uh, b both myself and bosses are completely invincible while they're charging up and doing special attacks. There's a lot of cases where I'll try to counter their special attack with my own. Because um, as, co as cool as special attacks are, an unfortunate thing about them in this game is that because there's a charge-up animation for doing them, that gives uh, oftentimes enemies the chance to just walk away so that, so that I miss. And um, but, but there's a lot of kind of controlled circumstances where if I... Um, do them like well a boss is about to use its own special attack i i know that i'm not going to miss as long as i have the right timing so like the first time that doing did a special attack i did my own and timed it so that i hit it right after it came out of iframes uh, the second time it was almost dead so it uh, generally would have been faster to just 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 finish it off with my hammer at that point and uh, as is often the case, I feel like in um, RPG speedruns, being a jerk is faster than being a, a friend. So we, got, we didn't stand up for Pearl here when she was getting uh, getting chewed out by Elazul, just because it cuts out a couple of text boxes. But no matter what choice we pick, Pearl gives us a couple of um, couple of, uh, of of new artifacts that we can continue our adventures.
All right, so I'm putting now. I'm putting down the flame artifact, which creates another town called Gato Grottos. I'm, I'm not actually going to be going here at all at, at, as part of the speedrun category, but uh, I'm uh, putting it down both to just as part of meeting that quota of 18 artifacts that I talked about earlier that I need to in order to be able to access the end game, and then also that's also setting up for. Um, Lumina, the, the next town I created here to have a higher land level, and in turn it'll have better equipment at its shops. I, I think I, I don't think I actually mentioned earlier that the two the two factors that affect the land level when you put down an artifact are how many other artifacts you've already put down, and how far away the um, the, the, the artifact you're putting down is from your house, the the, the, the house that you that you start the game at. So. Um, what I did there just kind of set up for Blumina having a higher land level. All right, so now we're doing a uh, quest called the Spirit's Light here. This is actually this quest doesn't have any fighting in it. This is just kind of a pure story and exploration quest. And we're doing this both so that we can buy a better weapon, but and, but also the artifact reward we get for finishing it lets us start the dragon storyline. So um, we're going into this. Um, town called Lumina that has this really I like really like the kind of ethereal uh, music that they use for it here and we get kind of briefly caught up in uh, the plans of this centaur named Gilbert to woo a, uh, a lamp uh, shopkeeper named uh, Monique who's actually a harpy and um, we're gonna help um, we're gonna help Monique sell some lamps to these um, cute little critters called thud bears uh, Dud Bears actually have their own language, which we're getting a crash course in right now. And um, after we get the tutorial, then we need to um, sell sell some lamps to bears. Fortunately, the uh, basically the, it, it's a series of um, kind of four questions we're being asked here, but fortunately the responses are the same every time, so I just have them all memorized. Dub, dub, by the way, means both is both a greeting and yes in the Dud Bear language. We want to see dub, but we don't, and we do not want to see gak, which means uh, displeasure. Because if you see gak, that means you uh, you picked a wrong option, and you have to uh, get the tutorial again in order to reset things. So we, we made a quick pit stop at the weapon shop there, too, in order to buy a steel two-handed sword, which is going to be our uh, next weapon for, uh, for a bit of the run. We also kind of took advantage of a, uh, of a, um, of a bit of an exploit, too, where um, when every time you sell a lamp to a dead bear, you actually get a thousand lucre, lucre being the currency in Mana Series games. And even though we're, that's not really our money, it's, it's, it's Monique's for her lamps. While we have the money on us, we can spend it with, with no lasting consequences other than a little disappointment uh, from uh, Gilbert when we uh, give him less money than he was expecting. So, uh, so we took advantage of that in order to buy the uh, steel two-handed sword without actually have technically being able to afford it. Again, being a jerk faster than being a friend. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a game that had like those options that let you like that would be faster being a friend at any point. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets worse. Right, 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 too. We're not we're not we're not actually going to be seeing it in this category. It's more of a thing in fairy storyline. But uh, there's some pretty bad things that you end up doing in the name of speed and in, uh, in, in some other quests in this game that. that uh, that are available because I guess that's another real thing worth pointing out too is that um, this this speed run is really only going to be showing off about 25% of this game because um, like I said there's three major story arcs which we're going to be doing one of uh, in full tonight but then there's a lot of um, just kind of unrelated side quests on top of it too so um, so I guess maybe that's maybe that can be a little uh, sales pitch to uh, to play this game if you haven't already too, just because um, there's just there's a lot more content than uh, 
that you'll be seeing tonight if this is your first uh, first um, time seeing it. Yeah, I've actually never seen this game before, um, so it's always a delight when I bring on RPGs like this that I didn't get to play growing up. Um, and I'm just like, ooh, if I can find like you know a pile of hours to invest, I really want to <laughs> yeah. play this. Just finding that's, that's, that pile that's of often, hours that's is often hard. The that's that's the challenge. Yeah, with I mean, with just video games, period, along with uh, RPGs, especially. Oh, absolutely. All right, so um, so we got the trembling spoon off of that, which um, lets us create the underworld, which is um, a very important land for the dragon storyline, which is where it's both going to start and finish. So we're we're setting that down. But, and now we're also um, putting down some other artifacts that we ha we've had on us for a while too, and that's that's part of um, another another kind of subtle system that this game has, which is called mana levels. Won't really get too deep into it because honestly, it just it, it just doesn't really matter that much for um, speed running. But um, in this particular case, um, we're, we're just we're, we're putting down these other artifacts in the exact sequence that we are here in order to um, adjust the mana levels of Lumina that we can so that we can head back in and then get a pet. Because again, we need a pet uh, coming up for a future quest in order to be able to uh, to finish it. So um, we're taking this opportunity to um, kind of just. Get 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 a pet without a uh, get a pet that'll actually be somewhat useful to us in combat and avoid having to go back home to pick up the uh, the, the rabbi that we got from the tutorial. A very evil and menacing goblin. I love the, I love how direct this uh, this guy is. I want to polish up on my evilness. Well, who are we to <laughs> say no? Who are we to say no to a request like that? <laughs> May seem kind of inefficient to come back in here to do that, but, but we we did have to finish the, uh, the the spirit's light quest along with adjusting the mana levels for Lumina in order for Guri the goblin to uh, to be there. So, so that's why we had to kind of make a return trip. All right, and then uh, with that, now it is time to formally start the dragon storyline. <laughs> You notice that the tight, like all of the uh, qu the events, have title cards when we uh, start and finish them. Which are because another an analogy I like to use with this game too is that if you think of most um, JRPGs being kind of like a movie, I like to compare this game more to like a TV series or anime series. And the fact that there's kind of uh, formal names and title cards for each of the uh, quests that we do kind of uh, kind of adds to that flavor too. So when the when the title card popped up for the Fallen Emperor, there was a red dragon behind the uh, behind the text, and that signifies that it's part of the dragon storyline. Oh, I, I guess there, there's a bit of basic movement tech I don't think I've explained yet too, which is called wiggle running. I guess it's kind of like the name implies that if I uh, wiggle the analog stick as I run to alternate between diagonals, it slightly speeds up my. Uh, my uh, movement speed and that it's not really a lot but it definitely adds up over the course of about an hour and a half or so run all right so during the kind of the, the cutscenes here we're getting introduced to kind of the lore behind the uh, dragon storyline which is that there are in the world there are uh, people called dragoons which are knights that serve dragons uh, we're kind of get we're getting um Conscripted by a dragoon named Lark here, who serves uh, who serves a dragon emperor named uh, Draconis, and uh, Lark is basically just kind of giving us a, a, a trial by fire, basically to kind of prove that we're worthy to uh, to serve to serve his master Draconis. We had to. Uh, Make that little detour there to the, get the baptism of fire in order to be able to continue going deeper into the underworld. This fight I've, is, I've always found kind of awkward because of how, uh, how close you start to the enemies. So a lot of times they can just walk up and start uh, start punching me before I can uh, 
to unlock them. All right, and then this next fight here is pretty notorious among uh, speedrunners of this game too, because if I was doing uh, if I was doing a PB attempt at this game instead of a like a no reset marathon style run, I'd actually be using a uh, a, a pretty different route, um, which would require me to farm a uh, one out of eight weapon drop from that fight I just finished right there called the Levitine Sword. And each failed attempt at getting the Levantine costs about 20 to 30 seconds or so. So uh, for, for um, showing this showing this game and run off to uh, to an audience like this, I definitely wanted to go for a, uh, a much more consistent type route. All right, so this is Hidodama, the, uh, the next boss. Um, unfortunately, this boss is has is pretty random as far as what it does and how that impacts how long it takes for me to win. Because you've already seen it do it do a teleport move, or it just did it again, where it disappears and then uh, kind of possesses the uh, the um, Oni uh, demon statues around the room to shoot lasers at me. And uh, every time it does that, it's a uh, it's kind of a time loss because there's really anything I can do to fight back. So I guess this fight's probably a good opportunity to talk about synchro effects, too. Because, like, right now, you notice there's kind of a bolt of lightning that's connecting my face portrait to Guri's in the HUD at the top. And um, every every ally or pet character in the game um, has kind of a special buff that they give your character if you're standing close to them when you're in combat. And then if I'm standing close to Guri, that actually increases the amount of damage that bladed weapons do. So um, a lot, during boss fights in particular, I'm often going to kind of, if, if, if I get the opportunity without uh, kind of missing chances to fight back, uh, stand close to Guri so that my sword swings do more damage. All right, so unfortunately that was a pretty slow Hidodama fight because I, I kind of lost count of how many teleports it ended up doing because and unfortunately, the more times Hirodama teleports, the longer each attack becomes as far as how many lasers shoot out of the Oni statues. But, um, but at least it, it, it cooperated kind of nicely near the end. All right, so by defeating Hirodama, we have kind of proven our worth to, um, to uh, both meet and now serve uh, Emperor Draconis, although we don't really have a whole lot of choice in the matter because we, when we entered the underworld, we kind of became a half spirit and uh, we're kind of being uh, kind of made to serve Draconis to try to uh, earn our freedom back from the underworld. So Draconis is now uh, tasking us to go hunt uh, three dragons of knowledge who are sealing his powers away. Gotta love those pesky, uh, those pesky, uh, catches of like, by the way, you're in the underworld now, um, so you're gonna be made to serve me, mm -hmm. and there's not much you're gonna be able to do about it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I like how it, the end of his sales pitch, too, is that it's giving us a chance to kind of prove our strength, but, uh... <laughs> Uh, it's not like we really kind of have a choice at this point if we want to kind of be free of the uh, the underworld for good. Exactly. It's like, I'm going to, like, sell you on this, but I don't really need to. <laughs> you, you don't have any other options, and, you know, you've you really got to just, just pretend I'm giving you a choice. All right, so um, one of the one of the artifacts we got for finishing um, our first visit to the underworld was the Skull Lantern, which which um, lets us go to the Norn Peaks here, which is where the first dragon that we're hunting lives. Uh, as soon as we uh, stop in, though, we actually meet another dragoon named Sierra. is going to be pretty important later. So we've just got two. Two pretty simple fights we need to do in this forest area before we actually start climbing Thorn Peaks proper. Oh yeah, I guess this is this this fight here is kind of a good uh, opportunity to talk about how I mean this game. I love this game's um, art style, especially the uh, pre-rendered backgrounds that uh, um, 
at Square and their uh, contractors at M2 did an amazing job at um, upscaling into HD as part of this remaster. But um, there's a lot of foreground objects in uh, some of the screens that um, can hide um, stuff behind them. And an issue that we can run into in a number of cases is that when we kill enemies and they drop stuff, it may fall behind in like in that previous screen, some trees in the foreground, and then we can't see them. We have to kind of try to watch where the uh, experience crystals and uh, coins are flying. Because again, in order to end a mob fight or a boss fight too, for that matter, we need to either collect all of the drops from the enemies or wait for them to despawn. And it's almost always faster to collect them, but doing actually doing that is, can be kind of challenging sometimes if, um, if they're obscured by foreground objects. Okay, and then while well, we're doing some base, kind of basic mob fights um, here on our way to the, to, uh, the first of three mini bosses that we have to fight, which are uh, which we actually met right outside before we started climbing up here. They're called Wind Callers, and they're they're also dragoons, but they serve uh, Acrivator, the uh, dragon of, of uh, knowledge that lives here. Um, so another um, really important combat mechanic in uh, speedrunning is um, what we call uh, attack canceling. Normally when we do um, power attacks, uh, which is the, uh, the right face button through my, the mapping uh, I have in my controller, there's about a second and a half or so long recovery animation before we can do anything else. But um, there's there's a couple of exploits that we can do in order to cancel that recovery animation. So what I'm doing here is that I'm I'm doing kind of power hits with my sword, but then I'm hitting the L1 button, which because the the shoulder buttons uh, map to your special attacks, but um, I don't have any special attacks mapped to the L1 button, so I'm able to use that to cancel the uh, the. Um, the recovery animation for the power attack and that just kind of translates into um just being able to pump out damage um, a lot fat and set up stun locks um in ways that weren't really intended uh, there, there's a there's there's a, there's a few other ways to um to cancel uh um power attacks too um the other, the other one that we, that, that uh, that's the most useful in speedrunning is is what's called jump canceling too. Because there's a um a special atta or a, kind of just a special ability you can equip called jump. I honestly don't really know what the intended usage of jump is, but um, if you press the button for jump when you're in the middle of an attack, it'll um, cancel the recovery animation and then um, actually cut directly to a uppercut attack. Um, so I'll point that out when I start actually using it. I don't have jump equipped right now. Again, fighting these wind callers here. When it, you're, you're, not, you're periodically noticing them, uh, kind of the screen dimming out, and then this um, kind of ring or uh, line starts uh, um, starts drawing out. That means they're actually trying to cast a spell, and I want to interrupt that ASAP, because if they finish the casting animation for the spell, uh, then they're going to be invincible for a few seconds. And if I get hit by their wind spell, there's a chance I can get stunned for like 10 seconds, too, which I very much don't want to have happen. All right, so we're just cl we're climbing up Norn Peaks here, and we have three of the wind callers to uh, to fight before we can actually kind of get past a barrier that's uh, blocking access to the bus. I'm using this opportunity because just because there's several mini boss and regular mob fights here. I'm using this as an opportunity to learn some skills that I'm going to need later too because the way you learn new um, special attacks is by just having either certain weapons or uh, certain other um, special abilities equipped and um, I'm, I'm, I'm basically working on learning uh, the counter strike ability through the kind of 
having certain other abilities equipped going going in and out of uh, the, the combat here. And uh, Counter-Strike is one of the most powerful melee attacks in the whole game. Uh, be very important for especially the final boss fight. All right, so yeah, these win. Yeah, like uh, like a uh, lemur who's the world record holder for uh, for this game is pointing out in chat. These wind collar fights are actually going pretty well because um, one one factor that uh, that, c that can kind of matter a lot in, um, in in a lot of boss fights in this run is um, what. Uh, what your ally character does, because um, so, some of them are a little more uh, kind of uh, rascally than others. Um, Lark isn't one of the worst of them, but um, he does he can sometimes knock uh, knock enemies that I'm trying to uh, fight away from me, and he, and just interfere with my uh, power cancel combo. Like so there's there's some cases where. Uh, like I'm, I'm, do, I'm just, I just have a, co a nice uh, combo going on one of the wind collars, and then Lark will just decide to, uh, to knock, to knock them away, and then I can't, or I have to kind of walk, uh, walk closer again, and, and that might give them an opening to start casting a spell too. I was talking about wiggle running uh, earlier too as a uh, basic movement tech, and it may not really be quite as obvious, but it's but I'm actually doing wiggle running when I'm in combat to to uh, to kind of cover ground faster. I legit thought that was the uh, the Discord screen sharing causing the uh, movement <laughs> to look as strange as it had been. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, yeah, no, I've been doing wiggle running in combat. I'm like, you know what? That that makes sense entirely. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, yeah, I mean, wiggle running, I think, is one of the biggest things that really kind of differentiates top level Legend of Mana speedrunners from, uh, from people that are just getting started, too, because. Uh, Doing really kind of optimized wiggle running takes a lot of practice. And I've been running this game since about last October or so, and I still don't consider myself to be a, uh, like an expert at the uh, movement tech in this game just because the skill ceiling is really high, which is something I just love about uh, particular speed games too. Like I, like I think... Um, I think this is kind of this is oftentimes I, I I feel really good recommending this as a first kind of a first speed game if anybody's interested in speed running an RPG just because there's uh, the the single story categories aren't terribly long and they're both very accessible and easy to get into but have very high skill ceilings if you really want to push yourself in the game. All right, so now we have Aggravator, who or as a lot of uh, runners like to call him Aggravator because. Uh, Aggravator has a, is very very random, and we're, we're getting our immediate taste of it too. Where right? I didn't even get a single hit in before um, Aggravator decided to, uh, to use a special attack on me. And I haven't I haven't gotten enough hits in to build up my own special attack meter enough to try to counter them with my own too, which is. Very frustrating when that happens because I don't really. I just have to wait out the animation. There's really kind of nothing I can do. So this is jump canceling that I'm doing right now that I talked about earlier too, where I'm uh, doing a power attack and then canceling it with the uh, um, with the uh, the jump skill, which um, which is why I'm doing kind of an up down kind of combo here. A little more effective than power canceling for trying to stun lock this boss, but Aggravator can just decide to nope out of being <laughs> out of taking damage at any point. It's a uh, it's a huge uh, kind of roadblock to uh, getting good times at this game, or, or I should say at this at this category. Seeing some people talk in chat about the remaster soundtrack too. Yeah, they, they actually did a complete orchestral 
remaster of the soundtrack as part of the HD version. But if you like the original music better, you can actually you can you can use it. There's just an option in the game settings to do the original soundtrack instead of the remaster. If that's your preference. Yeah, I've been like jamming to this entire OST this whole time, and your commentary has been really helpful in following along here. Oh, thanks. All right, so yeah, this is. <laughs> Pretty slow boss fight, unfortunately, but again, this is one of the most RNG heavy bosses in like in any any storyline run of this game. So uh, just having to kind of take it on the chin here and wait for Aggravator to decide to not be invincible. All right, finally got an opening to use use my own special attack. But uh, that's another thing Aggravator can do is just uh, kind of decide to not take damage from special attacks. <laughs> so, oh, Aggravator! But uh, anyway, we 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 won. <laughs> if you got, I mean, if you have enough experience with just. Reacting to Aggravator's patterns, there isn't really a whole lot of danger of dying, but um, you just, you just have, you're just kind of at the mercy of the uh, of the of the RNG as far as how long that fight takes. Did, I did a quick little micro optimization going into this cutscene here too, because while the screen is fading in, you can actually you actually have movement control very briefly. And I was holding the up button while this cutscene was loading, so that I would just walk a step up, and that that just shaves like half a second or a second off that cutscene when when because I, I had to move at one point as part of the cutscene and uh, that sped that up a bit. All right, so for finishing that we get um, the uh, dragon bone which um, which is where the next which is where Jajara, the next dragon of, uh, of wisdom is. One thing I do like about the Dragon storyline is just that the pacing is really nice in the speed run. Uh, we're just kind of going from, once we start the Dragon story arc, we're just kind of going from one quest to the other without kind of a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of downtime in between. Um, there is, um, one, there, we do have to do a quick side quest here called the Field Trip, because, um, um, there's a number, there's a few cases, kind of primarily in other categories besides this one, where in order to do a story arc required quest, we have to finish kind of another another quest that takes place in the same area. That's kind of that, that takes priority, just because uh, um, pretty much every land in this game has multiple events associated with it. But uh, this is a real this is a really quick one. We're just kind of helping uh, helping these students from. Uh, from a magic academy that uh, we're not going to be kind of directly visiting as part of this run, but we could just kind of get introduced to them here. And they're they're doing some experiments um, at, at a archaeological dig. And uh, basically, I just had to talk to three specific NPCs um, to uh, to get the correct ingredients for the uh, for the experiment. All right, so now that that's out of the way, now we can actually start the Ghost of Nemesis, which is the next uh, Dragon Storyline quest. Love that roar animation. I, I've heard some pretty wimpy dragon roars in, uh, in video games over my lifetime, but I think that one's pretty legit sounding. I love what this. What are some uh, of the this... wimpier dragons? <laughs> And then uh, I, I love the animation for this skeleton uh, appearing to where it just kind of opens a slit in uh, space and time. And it's very, very important that we pick the second dialogue option because if we pick the first one, uh, we're just kind of deciding we, we're, we're just kind of deciding to give up. And then we get to watch that animation reverse and then leave and come back and then see it again. It's kind of a pretty significant time loss if we uh, pick the wrong option. All right, so. Again, I'm using the jump cancel technique in order to uh, to um, just unlock this mini boss here. All right, pretty clean fight. 
That guy can sometimes decide to just kind of jump around and uh, be hard to hit, but, um, but it, it cooperated uh, pretty well. All right. So then I was I was when we when we had that uh, unfortunate uh, incident with the uh, with the beast egg that just wasn't decided it wasn't hungry. I was talking about how um, even though that's kind of officially a side quest, it's eventually going to be a required um, a requirement for the dragon storyline. And this is this is it basically. In order to um, enter enter Jajara's bone fortress. We had to have three people in our party in order to press all three of those switches. And uh, the pet, we have ourselves, um, Lark, and then and, and then Yuri the Goblin. But unfortunately, we fell into a trap and kind of got dropped into the basement. So we need to uh, first get reunited with Yuri and then later with Lark in order to um, kind of get back to the top. And then uh, right here is where we're actually going to be getting um, getting an upgraded weapon that we're going to be using for the rest of the run, a uh, two-handed sword called the Brave Blade. And unfortunately, the uh, most efficient way to get a good weapon upgrade is through um, farming for a random drop. Like I was talking earlier about how the um, the, uh, the the optimal route for going for a really fast uh, PB or record at the, at, at this run um, involves having to farm for a uh, a random drop in the uh, underworld, and then and then do, if you did that, then you would then have to do have to farm for another drop here, like we're doing now. So um, the odds uh, the odds for getting this weapon are one out of eight per um, per per sword enemy that I kill here. And I get um, I get two chances at it for encounter. So optimal since I have to fight, I have to go through this room twice as part of rescuing Guri. I get um, four chances at the drop without losing really losing time. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. So now I'm just kind of having to keep resetting this room and refighting the uh, the swords until I get it. But again, it's about a, it's a one out of eight chance for uh, for kill. This doesn't take too much longer. I love the small details um, in the background here, like yeah. the dangling bones. Yeah, and like in some cape. cases, they, yeah, like in some cases, there's skulls that 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 follow you, or that are looking at you too. But yeah, just it's just such a gorgeous game. I mean, the, like a lot, the art style in some cases too reminds me of like um, uh, like '90s point-and-click PC adventure games too, like the, like the Sierra Online games. All right, so we got our Brave Blade and we got and we got Guri back. So I was able to uh, press the two switches in order to um, to open this elevator. And we and uh, you may remember Sierra, who made a brief appearance at the start of the, uh, the last major quest. Well, now she uh, she she doesn't really like us too much. She knows that we're hunting uh, hunting the good dragons, so um, she's going to try to stop us. And then this is our first time using the Counter Strike skill, which is very very effective against humanoid type bosses like Sierra here. So counter strike, kind of like the uh, the name implies, is a counter attack. So when I um, when I have it equipped, um, when I press the button that's that it's mapped to, I just kind of I just kind of strike a defensive pose for a few seconds. And then if an enemy does a uh, does a melee attack nearby, then I'll do I'll I'll do a counter attack. And the counter attack is very 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 strong uh, with the uh, with the two, with the two-handed sword type weapon that I have um, equipped right now, it actually gets an eight times damage multiplier. So you saw that I was able to uh, take down Sierra in like about I think about four or five hits or so with Counter Strike, and yeah, yeah, like Lemur's pointing out, that was actually a pretty good fight too, just because um, Sierra can sometimes decide to uh, show show off her dance moves instead of uh, actually swing her, uh, her her daggers at me, and we can just kind of do that repeatedly and I have to wait I just have to kind of watch and wait until uh he actually gives me the right pattern for counter striking 
All right, so we got a couple of our bosses before we're uh, before we're done with um, the Bone Fortress. The first one is Deathbringer. Like, Shoutouts to the sprite work too. This is one of the best kind of lich sprites I've ever seen in a uh, a fantasy RPG like this. And then you're kind of you, you made you just notice how how fast that health bar is dropping too. I mean that's why that's why that's why we need that brave blade drop, even though it can be kind of a pain because of the RNG. Having uh, having stronger weapons uh, speeds up boss fights uh, really significantly. All right, and then with that, it's time to fight the dragon Jajara. Oops. I was trying to do a bit of a micro-optimization there with um, kind of running around to get Guri to catch up to me before hitting the boss trigger, but I let go of, my, of the uh, D-pad just a hair too late. So you kind of saw, you saw Guri slow walking up, which is that's an unfortunate thing about having pets going into uh, certain cutscenes. And uh, we, can, we, can, we can shave a little bit of time off that slow walk by kind of running around in circles right outside the boss trigger, but unfortunately I messed it up there. We've got the skeletal dragon Jajara here. I'm gonna try to counter his special attack with my own here. Yeah, you saw that, that did like a bar and a half worth of damage, but um, but again, it's it's under it's generally under kind of very controlled circumstances where I actually use special attacks because between both the uh, the charge up time for them and then the uh, restrict the kind of the restriction of what the hitbox for them is like, you, it's very easy to just miss when. Uh, if you do them when uh, when you kind of don't know that you're set up to hit, but yeah, Jajara is a phase two. I don't quite. I've never quite understood what the point of these of picking up these statues are, other than maybe for uh, kind of a dragon form of flexing. But uh, anyway, ah, ah, this is, if um, if I was ready for a special attack, I'd probably be able to finish Jajara off with it. But I'm but my. The, my bar, which is right below my health bar on top, is uh, was just a sliver too far away. All right, so that's the second of our three dra uh, dragons of knowledge down. When we uh, visit these dragons um, layers too, we're actually seeing what are called mana stones too, which are a bit of a throwback to Trials of Mana, which is the third mana game, which um, actually which got a really awesome remake uh, about two years ago too, that I highly recommend. Pick the third option there just because it uh, speeds up this conversation a little bit. Alright, and with that we get the green cane artifact, which um, lets us head straight to uh, the next dragon quest. This area has generally one of the more popular kind of dun kind of dungeon exploration themes too. And this is this is the only time we'll be hearing it in this category too. So uh, enjoy it while it lasts. Oh, this is a track I could just vibe to. Mm-hmm. So um, something you may have noticed, especially if you're not familiar with this game, especially when especially when we were in the underworld earlier, is that this this game really likes to have kind of really mazy type dungeons where um, you've got a lot of um, kind of small screens that um, 
are connected by uh, loading screens, and as a result, that makes it kind of easy to get disoriented and lost if you don't know where you're going. But um, there's a couple dungeons like this one where you do get a little help from the game and in, uh, in, in where you go. Like in this case, every time I hit a screen transition, Lark uh, tells me if I'm if he senses Sierra and, the, and Vidis, the third dragon, uh, in that direction. So that's that's always nice. A couple of the mob fights here just have kind of uh, kind of weird enemy placements too. Where it, uh, as far as um, I have to kind of d decide on the fly whether I want to try to set up a spin to hit multiples at the same time or just go for uh, power cancels. One more mob fight in time for uh, the D's. Oops. Yeah, okay, that's. Yeah, I guess that's a that's a bit of a demonstration of why uh, wiggle running is optimally is pretty challenging because uh, if you try to wiggle run while you're uh, coming off a screen transition, a pretty easy mistake to make is to kind of bonk into the corner and then hit the kind of hit the loading trigger for the screen transition. You just um, came from, so that I just wasted a little bit of time there because of that. No biggie, though. All right, so... So we reach the heart of the White Forest and uh, find uh, find Sierra here, too. And we're about to see one... Just, I mean, I, I keep I keep pumping up the sprite work for uh, for the, the dragons in particular, and uh, of, of all of them, this is probably my favorite. About to see here. Because we get Fluffy Dragon. Fluffy! I love the uh, kind of kind of hair tie like uh, thing that Vadis has on her tail, too. Yeah, it's a really nice detail there. I've been recently like getting into like learning pixel art and just seeing uh -huh. sprite work like this is absolutely inspiring. Yeah, yeah, because because like it's like this was because this was originally a PlayStation One game released in 2000 and uh, something I've developed a lot of appreciation for over the past like decade or so is uh, kind of is games of this era that stuck to pixel art instead of going to 3D uh, polygon models because late. Uh, 2D era pixel art, I think, just has aged so, so much better than early 3D models did. Oh, without a doubt. All right, so the so the Vidis fight is actually kind of two bosses in one. We get we both we have Vidis, and then we also have Sierra. And what how kind of fast or slow this fight goes often comes down to what Sierra does. She was really nice and more or less just kind of left me alone there, but uh, she can really interfere with me trying to uh, power cancel the Ds if she wants to. All right, so that was pretty solid. So yeah, I just did, I did power cancels on the Ds and, and uh, Counter Strike on Sierra because again, Counter Strike is very effective against humanoid style bosses. All right, so that so now we've um, we've we've hunted down all three of the uh, dragons of knowledge. Although we, we didn't technically uh, um, defeat Vidis, but uh, I, I guess it still counts as part of our contract with uh, Draconis. We're just we're putting down some artifacts here, I believe, to adjust the mana levels for the underworld, where we're, where we're about to go to next to uh, to actually conclude the dragon storyline.
kind of glossed over to her during the cutscene before Radis, we actually find out that Lark and Sierra are brother and sister. They're kind of on opposite sides of a uh, of a conflict between Draconis and uh, the, the three dragons of knowledge. And um, I mean, we we were pretty pretty clearly working for the bad the bad uh, people um, up until now. But now we're we're basically being given the we were kind of set free from our uh, from our contract um, after Lark um, found the kind of took Vadis's mana stone, and now we're going to kind of we're joining up with Sierra to try to set things right. We're heading back into the underworld to uh, confront Draconis. So, the first ha the first half of uh, this of this uh, quest is just heading back to the bottom of the underworld, kind of like we did when we first came here. So I'll use this opportunity to talk about how just another thing I adore about this game is the continuity, because um, you've got a, this game does a really good job of setting up uh, NPCs and guest characters, both as far as making them both kind of visually distinctive from each other, and also having them have continuity as far as kind of where they are and what they're doing. And we're not we're not going to see it as part of the speed run, but um, there's characters that are part of other storylines that die as part of their storyline, and um, characters that die as part of the game actually come in some cases come to the underworld. So um, I just I like that bit of continuity that we can kind of visit deceased uh, NPCs in various parts of the underworld. We're just we're, we're back where we fought Hito Dama earlier, but now we're heading a little deeper into the underworld. This place is super super easy to get lost in with all of these uh, with all of these doors. And we're able to take advantage of a uh, fast travel here because. Uh, um, it, this is, I think this is more intended to be a, uh, um, a punishment, I guess, for lack of a better term, where if you get caught by the shadows, which are basically kind of shade-like creatures um, in that screen there, they send you to the bottom of the underworld. Um, and that's a bad thing for certain other optional quests that take place here, where if you get caught, you kind of have to restart what you're doing. But it, but for, for for our purposes here, that's 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 good because it um, it. It lets us skip a couple more screens running through the underworld on our way to the bottom. Alright, so then here we kind of get a little bit of a uh, <clears throat> a little bit of a twist here where because um, again, dragoons are uh, knights that serve dragons. Uh, Lark is, was um, Draconis' dragoon, but we find out now that he wasn't really kind of serving Draconis uh, um, out of loyalty, he was. Um, it was part of a, kind of part of an agreement they had, where after, if if they vanquished the dragons of knowledge, they would fight each other, and then the winner would be free from the underworld. But uh, Lark kind of finds out here that if you make deals with the devil, the devil doesn't always honor uh, his or her end of it. So. Uh, Draconis kind of curses Lark and turns him into this centaur-like uh, creature. It was our first boss fight for uh, the Crimson Dragon quest. It's a pretty simple fight. We just kind of jump cancel Lark into the corridor and hope that he doesn't do what he's about to do here, which is his uh, kind of rocket punch attack here, which is the slower of his two uh, special attacks. Again, when I'm, as part of um, boss fights with this 
with this um, route that I'm using too. I'm trying to kind of position my uh, character to be fairly close to my goblin pet Guri whenever possible because uh, you may notice light kind of lightning streams connecting various characters on the HUD at the top of the screen. And wh whenever that's happening, that means that um, I'm getting a buff from that other character. And Guri's makes my uh, attacks with sword type weapons do extra damage. So I'm always kind of trying to take advantage of that whenever possible. Because even though this route isn't what I'd use for a PB attempt, because the, the, the overall routing is a little slower than a uh, another route that um, kind of that requires a little more RNG to line up for a good time. That that route uses a different pet, which is a um, a tomato man, which is a, uh, a type of monster in the world of the Mana series that um, that, uh, that 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 makes that makes some, a lot of some of the fights play out fairly differently. So um, the, just kind of the unique aspect of having the uh, bladed weapon synchro effect with the goblin. Uh, I find really fun when I'm doing runs with this route. So I guess I'll take this opportunity during this cutscene too to gush about the soundtrack in another way too. Um, all three of the major storylines kind of have a musical theme associated with them. Like we're hearing the, the dragon storyline theme right now as part of this cutscene. We heard it like from some others too. But we're about to go into the flames, Draconis's fortress, which is the, the final dungeon of the dragon storyline. And then the music for the flames is kind of a rearrangement of this music here. And then uh, when we fight Draconis at the end, his battle theme is going to be another variation on that too. That's something I just absolutely adore in uh, soundtracks to games when you've got um, when you have musical themes associated with kind of its characters and story beats that. Uh, Kind of make it make it feel kind of like a movie soundtrack in a way. This particular fight, I always find the, I find the enemy positioning is fairly awkward as far as trying to clean them up optimally. Because the swords often kind of rush towards you and make it really hard to get a good spin set up without. Uh, without um, risking stunning yourself. For the person saying that the soundtrack sounds very Kingdom Heartsy, it's the same composer. Yep. Yeah, this is done by Yoko Shimomura, who uh, w went on to do the Kingdom Hearts uh, series soundtrack starting about two years after this game came out. He's also known for the for Super Mario RPG and the Mario and Luigi RPG series, along with a lot of other great games over her career. There's actually a, a game coming out called Live Alive or Live Alive on the Nintendo Switch uh, in yep. a couple weeks. That um, it's it's a remake of a Japanese-only Super Nintendo RPG that Yoko Shimomura did the soundtrack for, too. And I've heard little snippets already of the uh, remake uh, soundtrack, and I really like what I'm hearing so far. All right, so we felt we... Um, that, that, that kind of really ornate-looking door that we went through and then fell into a pitfall a few screens ago. That's actually where Draconis is, but uh, before we can actually get to Draconis, we have to uh, take care of three dragon mini-bosses throughout the fortress. So for this first one, I want to uh, use jump can because one, uh, one thing about uh, jump cancels is that it pushes uh, enemies away. And uh, we're do I'm doing that here to, to make it so that I kill the dragon on the right side of the screen. So that that's that that that's a little more optimal for movement because I because as soon as I kill this dragon, I'm just heading back out to uh, go to a different part of the fortress. And this ends the fight closer to the exit that way.
yeah, Mecha Link in chat's giving a good explanation of kind of how the uh, pitfall mechanics and the flames work, because it's not something that's really kind of, oops, not something that's really kind of directly explained very well in the game. But just the the goal of what we're doing is to turn off the the pitfall trap that, that blocks access to Draconis's room. And we're falling through some of them just on intentionally for for just for faster movement through the fortress. Alright, so we've got our second dragon mini boss here. <laughs> yeah, Lemur pointing out that um yeah, th I mean, um, something you probably noticed uh, throughout this run too is that there really aren't. There's, there's, there's very, very little, few, few glitches in this game. Uh, the, uh, the three mana games before this were very, very glitchy in both good and bad ways for speedrunning. But um, this one is pretty solidly programmed. I mean, in the fairy storyline category, there's, um, there's. There's a dungeon that has a couple of very minor skips um, as far as skipping two six-second cutscenes and in uh, the original version of the game, about a 20, 30-second fight. But aside from that, um, um, the reason we're... The reason we're, be kind of, we're able to finish this game as fast as we are, despite it being a, uh, a full-length JRPG, is just through really, uh, really clever routing and good combat strategies, rather than... Uh, um, kind of breaking the game through glitches, but if, uh, but but yeah, if if anybody's able to find some useful glitches in this game, though, you uh, definitely make a lot of friends in the Legend of Mana community. This is your call to arms, Twitch chat. <laughs> Okay, Sierra helped me out there because yeah, I knew there was a coin hid hidden behind that pillar because uh, yeah, the fight didn't end. But uh, at, at that point, I pretty much just gave up and started walking towards the uh, the exit while waiting for the coin to despawn. But then uh, Sierra helped me out and picked it up. All right, it's a little micro optimization here, by because normally you're supposed to approach the gem at the bottom of the screen to initiate the boss fight. But if you just turn around and walk and try to leave through the door you came in, that loads it a bit faster. So we've got Zenoa here. Uh, this is pretty much just Lark 2.0. This is really the, the same boss fight we did uh, at the end of the Underworld. And just like Lark, using the uh, Rocket Punch attack, which is forward, it's two uh, special attacks. But I, I used the... Uh, I used the uh, time that, that Zenoa was invincible in order to uh, time a lunging arc attack to, uh, to finish it off. Alright, so that's our three mini-bosses down, so we've now turned off the uh, pitfall trap. It, it, it is the first pitfall trap that we fell into. With that, it's time to confront Draconis. Who has a pretty sick throne room, if I may say so, between that uh, that uh, that throne that has dragon fangs all along it, along with these kind of perpetual flames in the background too. You will become my sustenance. That is, uh, this back top there. I like that his wings are just giant hands instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
This is a bit. This was a bit of a risk I took in using my uh, lunging arc on Zenoa, because because if Draconis decides to use a pretty early special attack, I, w I probably won't be able to counter it. But uh, I was hoping it wouldn't happen. So my, my cue for how to time my lunging arc when Draconis does that uh, nom nom attack is five uh, munches. All right, not bad. That was, uh, that was a pretty solid Draconis fight for the RNG I got. Poor, poor Guri and uh, Sierra taking a, taking a nap here after getting uh, fire, bre fire breathed and then uh, munched on by Draconis. But uh, we'll get back up. Yeah, Dracona, actually hitting Draconis can be kind of challenging, too, just because his hitbox can be a little wonky, but I always like to aim for the uh, the shadow in between his legs. But when he moves around, just kind of staying on top of where his hitbox is uh, can be kind of challenging. I personally really like to use my, or I, I use use a, use a lunge attack. Cause something, I guess one one kind of general general just thing about how combat works in this game is that um, a lot of the um, special moves that you can do actually are kind of pseudo based on fighting game inputs. Cause uh, like I do a double tap forward and then a uh, a um, a strong attack in order to do a lunging thrust with my sword, like I was doing on Draconis there. And then if you do a quarter circle roll followed by an attack, you'll do an uppercut, kind of the same move that I uh, that I'm able to do uh, with the jump cancel technique. All right, so we're so with Draconis defeated, we're kind of wrapping up the uh, the dragon storyline here. Where um, um, we're we're actually releasing we're releasing the souls of the uh, dragons of knowledge to uh, kind of go back and guard the mana stones again. And um, kind of Lark, uh, we released Lark's soul from Draconis as part of that too, but uh, kind of as penance for uh, for um, the evil deeds he did while serving Draconis. He's uh, kind of going to be forced to stay in the underworld uh, for a thousand years, but uh, eventually, he, uh, eventually he does... Uh, Get his freedom. This we'll be learning uh, at the end of this cutscene. But uh, but yeah, this like uh, like Monocled Unicorn is mentioning in chat. This is a uh, this is a bit of a, a nice little input break too. Whenever we finish one of the uh, three major storylines, um, we actually get a cutscene where we don't have to mash text. The text kind of all auto scrolls in order to I'm assuming in order to sync up with the music. So um um you actually need if you're running this and you actually need like a restroom break or something this is a great opportunity to do so but um but yeah i guess i guess while we're since we've got about another maybe minute and a half to two minutes here i guess do you have any like uh plugs or announcements or anything Amber? Yeah, I absolutely do. I just want to remind everyone that Frame Fatales is going to be having its next all-women speedrunning event, Flame Fatales, from August 21st to the 27th. That's not far off. The marathon schedule is now out, and if you could type exclamation mark FF in Twitch chat or go to gamesdonequick.com forward slash Frame Fatales, you'll be able to get more info on that. And also, if you want to check out Games Done Quick on Instagram, it's at Games Done Quick, and you'll be able to get bite-sized clips from our hotfix shows and see what happens at the events which is really really cool and uh lastly if you are considering if you're hungry for a marathon that you want to submit to one and done -a is coming up again where you can show off your favorite run and that's your only appearance in the series the second installment will be happening on august 13th to the 14th so august is kind of jam-packed with marathons and submissions are open from now until july 20th so use uh exclamation mark ODAT or O-A-D-A-T in chat to find out more info and submit your run. Right, sounds good. All right. So um, with that, we have now finished the uh, finished the dragon storyline. So like I said, kind of when we were first getting started with the run, there's two things that we need to do in order to be able to start the end game for Legend of Mana and then finish, access the final boss and finish the run. One of those is to... Um, finish one of the three main storylines dragon fairy or jumi and then the other is to have 18 artifacts um, placed on the overworld 
but we've now done one of those as far as finishing the dragon storyline, but we haven't quite gotten 18 artifacts yet. So before we can kind of start heading towards the end game, um, we're actually going to do a, um, a side quest here called Summer Lovin', which is uh, it's just it's just the most optimal side quest that we can do in order to um, get the remaining artifacts that we need in order to, uh, to be able to finish the run. And uh, we're we're saving it until um, pretty late in the game, just just to make it faster, because we're actually kind of over leveled at this point for the uh, land level of the uh, of Medora Beach here. And the, the amount of health that the enemies have, and the, and the boss, too. There's a, uh, there's a pretty fun, uh, um, well, fun, in air quotes, mini-game that you, that, you, that you can do in this area, too, where you, where you notice I kind of stomped on two crabs in that last screen there. Um, there's 32 total crabs uh, in the beach, and... Um, Stopping all 32 of them is actually an achievement in this uh, HD remaster of uh, Legend of Mana. I forget if you actually get anything from it in the original game, but uh, if you want to get uh, you want to get platinum or get all the achievements on Steam. You actually need to uh, stop all the crabs, and that's actually way way harder than you think too, just because you're. Uh, you have kind of limited windows to uh, to stop some of them before they just peace out and uh, you lose your chance. But for a speed run, we actually want to avoid stopping any crabs because each one wastes like a half second, second or so of uh, with the animation, along with that we uh, stop moving briefly too. Oh, you get okay. So you get it. You get a yeah. That's that's a, that's something that's that we don't really see. Uh, any of in this shorter speedrun categories is that you can actually do various kinds of upgrades to your house, our house that we haven't actually gone back to since starting the game. But uh, like you can get a workshop to uh, do to do weapon up, up crafting and upgrades. You can get a um, a place where, in addition to, because there's a ranch that uh, that you can raise pets on, but you can also get a, uh, a workshop where you can build golems to uh, to work with you. And you can also get um, get characters to uh, kind of visit your house too. I guess in this case, a uh, baby penguin. If you get all the crabs. So the very the very first boss that we fought was uh, Mantisan, who's the first boss of Secret of Mana. And now we're actually fighting Full Metal Hagger, who's the first boss of Trials of Mana, the third mana game. So again, we're kind of over leveled for uh, for this boss's stats. So um, unfortunately, I'm getting kind of I'm getting a little bad luck here as far as it uh, doing that jump attack. Because optimally, I just uh, push it to the side and then run down its health bar before uh, without really really doing anything. Yep, this is our giant enemy crab. Another little subtle bit of uh, speed tech I've been doing, uh, in particular after boss fights too, is I've been because when it, most bosses drop uh, both experience and money, and I always try to grab the experience crystals before the money because whenever you level up, which is usually guaranteed after uh, after boss fights, um, that that introduces a bit of delay before uh, the you get the result screen and the fights end. So. Um, so I know I'm going to level up after most boss fights. I try to um, pick up the experience crystals first so that it starts the level up animation sooner and then kind of a little micro optimization as far as trying to uh, get out of the fights here faster. All right, so we get to uh, get our last two artifacts for uh, finishing Summer Lovin'. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of empty all of our all of the artifacts that we have at this point. We're not actually going to be going to any of these areas. This is just putting down uh, uh, the last four artifacts to get us up to 18. Hey, Tim, thanks for luck. Okay. 
Also, uh, I heard that there's news of an event coming up that you're planning or, you know, something to that effect. Uh, do you want to maybe mention that? Oh, sure. Well, I, uh, there's a there's a uh, there's a charity event that I help organize called RPG Limit Break, which um, uh, is probably a good way to explain it is that it's a lot like uh, live games done quick events, only it's uh, it's focused uh, focused specifically on RPGs. And we just announced um, our uh, return to uh, in, to uh, in person events. Uh, uh, in, I believe the October. F- 14th, I think, is I'd have to look up the dates exactly, but um, it's in uh, mid-October. Uh, the exact dates are on our website, rpglimitbreak.com, and submissions are going to be opening next weekend, also at rpglimitbreak.com. rpglimitbreak.com. Cool. And then in All addition, right, well, it, Richard got me to it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Richard. Yeah, and then in, in addition to um, to to our to our charity marathon that supports the national alliance on mental illness we do host community rpg focused marathons uh kind of like the gdq hotfix shows on our channel throughout the rest of the year too all right so with um with 18 artifacts placed on the um on the overworld um we're now I had I had to um, kind of enter my house, leave, and then enter it again in order to um, kind of advance the uh, kind of set a story flag needed for uh, starting the end game. But uh, once we see the uh, the sproutlings, which are, which are kind of strange plant-like creatures that we uh, see throughout the world um, in front of our house, then we know that we've um, we're kind of on pace to uh, to the end game now. Um, since it's, since it's sometimes a point of confusion with um, people that aren't familiar with this game, you actually you, you can do all you can do all three of the main storylines in one playthrough. You do not have to commit to one of them. You only have to finish one of them in order to be able to uh, to beat the game. But like in a uh, in a casual playthrough, I would highly recommend doing all three of the uh, of the quest lines: the Dragon Fairy and Jumi. Um, storylines along with the uh, along with side quests and stuff that you can do too. So during that conversation there um, between um, a wizard named uh, Nunazak who looks kind of like an animated stained glass window. It's a really unique and kind of cool uh, design for a, uh, a character. And then a um, one of the uh, seven wisdoms uh, named uh, Pulkiel. The wisdoms aren't really part of the dragon storyline too much, but they're uh, just kind of people, wise people and animals that uh, guide the destiny of mortals in this world. We're just kind of having a conversation about the Tree of Mana, which um, which is a recurring theme in Mana series games and about um, and about how the uh, the sproutlings are the seeds of the mana tree, and uh, and then uh, Nunazak was basically kind of trying to interfere with the sproutlings reviving the mana tree because of kind of knowing that uh, he, that uh, humanity um, previously abused the power of mana long long ago, which we got which we kind of read about in the uh, the intro when we started the game. Personally, I don't really view the kind of the final quest with the mana trees kind of this one of this game's stronger points. Um, but um, it, I, they just kind of, they just kind of had to uh, wrap this game up somehow and just just kind of decided to uh, have you visit the mana tree and purify it from corruption. But, I, I just kind of view the uh, I view this game as kind of more 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 of kind of just kind of about getting immersed in this gorgeous looking and sounding world and meeting meeting characters and. Getting involved with uh, shorter quests is kind of where this game shines more than the uh, the end game that wraps it all up. But um, but for um, for doing that short quest there called the Cage of Dreams, we get the Sword of Mana, which is the final the final artifact, which um, which lets us summon the Tree of Mana, which is um, which is the final dungeon area. Uh, is the gamepad recommended for this game? Yes, I, I find there's a, there's a fair bit. I mean, this game was originally made for running on a PlayStation with a DualShock controller. So having having 
analog movement is uh, I find a lot more uh, comfortable for playing this game. But but I mean it's, it's it's available on PC. You can definitely play it with keyboard if you'd prefer. Yeah, a game that has brawler controls, like, I I personally can't fathom playing on a keyboard, but, like, there are people who can. Mm-hmm. All right, so we, we, know, we know it's getting serious when we get the title drop there, too. Legend of Mana is the name of the final quest. We could talk to Sage Pulkiel there to get some more lore about the uh, the Tree of Mana and then the Mana Goddess, but uh, we just we 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 uh, we're going fast, so we just uh, we just skip on by. So, for, be despite, so just for being the final dungeon, the Tree of Mana is actually fairly short, especially if you uh, kind of know how to get straight to the end. And the, you don't really have that many required fights. And because this screen is kind of large, I'm just I'm not bothering to collect the uh, experience drops from the uh, that eagle enemy just because I know they're going to despawn while I'm fighting that basilisk there. Ball enemy really making with the dodges there. Alright, so the tree of mana kind of has two halves to it. There's the tree itself and there's the mana sanctuary on top. It's a, kind of a bit of a throwback to um, the first mana game originally released as uh, Final Fantasy Adventure and then later remade as Adventures of Mana. So, the the Mana Sanctuary is kind of a is a three by three grid basically, and um, in order to um, progress to the Mana Goddess, the final boss, we need to just kind of travel around the grid and then win the mob fights in the four corners. So that Dryad was a little <laughs> well, like Guri kind of trolled me a bit there, I should say, by uh, stun locking the the Dryad so that it wouldn't set up my Counter Strike. I could, even because even though I'm I'm well past the point where having having my pet goblin is actually required as part of the uh, as part as part of progressing in the game, I could um, go go back to the ranch at my house and drop him off there. But that would be slower than just just keeping him to the end of the game and uh, kind of eating the minor time losses in certain cutscenes for having another character. So that's the last of the four mob fights. So we're, now we're just going to get uh, automatically sent to the uh, to the fight with the Mana Goddess. And I, I really, really love the uh, visual backdrop for this fight, too, especially in the HD remaster where you can kind of see the uh, star field in the background that makes this just look like a page out of a kind of a pop-up page out of a storybook, too. 
So, um, the mana goddess is uh, humanoid, which means we're going to be using Counter Strike, and then uh, time is going to be when uh, when her health bar hits zero. Well, we're not really getting close to it. But unfortunately, the mana goddess does like to kind of dance around and um, sometimes attack Guri instead of me, which is which is un which is unfortunate when I'm using a uh, when I'm using a. Um, a, a reactionary based um, strategy. I, just, I messed up my timing there for my uh, counters for my lunging arc. For, I do I do consider the mana goddess fight in the dragon storyline category to be the most difficult one because of um, the hitbox for your two-handed sword is kind of awkward for hitting with count hitting her with counter strikes, and you've got your pet, which she can sometimes um, aggro against instead of you. I have one more hit, and time. GG. Everyone, get your GGs out for Puexel. That was like honestly a visual treat because this game is a visual treat, but also your commentary like helped me follow that run a lot. So oh, thank thanks. you so much for uh, for offering to do this run. Yeah, thanks for the invitation too. Greatly appreciated it. So, yeah, and then um, the um, one of the other things about the HD remaster that I think they really really improved on too is the FMVs because on the uh, PS1 version they they've got kind of the uh, kind of grainy choppiness that's pretty typical of uh, full motion video on. Uh, PlayStation One games and like on when you when you beat the Mana Goddess on that version that that kind of really nice looking uh, FMV in the background isn't quite as nice looking so I really like how much uh, how much nicer it looks here with kind of showing the Mana Tree being purified through your uh, through your actions. Yeah, like also your estimate was on point. We got a one thirty seven forty four. <laughs> oh, nice. Calculated. <laughs> Oh, like yeah. even with all the egg, uh, egg monster or monster egg trolling early on, just like yeah, I'm gonna chill here for like yeah, two minutes. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean this. I, I feel like I played pretty well in this run, but I just, I had some just really really rough luck uh, at a couple points too. Yeah, like the egg, the egg wasn't hangry enough. Um, Acrovator gave me some really horrendous patterns as far as um, how long it was invincible. Um, it took it took me a while to farm the brave blade drop. Like I had to, like again, I I had four chances at a one out of eight drop, and then I I didn't get it, so I had to uh, I had to go for some extra. But uh, but I guess yeah, I guess that was that was all according to plan, just to uh, just to uh, make myself look like a wizard in estimation. <laughs> look, but yeah, I, I, but if it works, it works. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess do uh, I guess while we're wrapping up, I guess do you or anybody in chat have any uh, any questions or anything about uh, about the game or the run? Well, I think I have a better question. Where can people find you? And also, if you don't mind plugging RPG Limit Break one last time for the folks in the sure. back. <laughs> well, you can find me at uh, twitchtv slash Poexel. I uh, I stream pretty consistently on Sunday evenings, um, usually starting around seven to eight p.m. U.S. Central Time. Um, I, 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 I'm, pr I'm probably not. I'm, unfortunately, for people that are that are hungry for more of this game, I'm probably going to be taking a break from it for a while, just because I did do a lot of speedrunning of Legend of Mana in late 2021 and the, in the first half of uh, 2022. But I do definitely plan to uh, to um, to return to this game at some point um, to uh, to go for some better times. But um, but yeah, in general, I. Uh, I speed run um, classic RPGs like I'm like I've done a lot of the Final Fantasy series and uh, Chrono Trigger, and um, this is this is actually my first Mana series game that I've been that I've uh, done speed runs of, and I definitely want to do some more too. Like a, a game that I'm kind of eyeing as a future speed game project is Secret of Mana. Um, looking at the glitch list category for that, and um, and yeah, so yeah. Classic RPG speedrunning is um, what I generally do on my own channel. But yeah, like I mentioned earlier too, I am one of the head organizers for a charity um, speedrun event called RPG Limit Break, which is kind of, it's kind of it's a lot like uh, Games Done Quick uh, events as far as being uh, um, 
speedrunning for charity, in our case, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. But, um, but our events are a little smaller in scale and are primarily focused on, um, on RPGs. And um, we're uh, going to be opening submissions for our, um, for our charity event, which is it's going to be both in person at a um, at a venue in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, but also have a uh, hybrid element too, with um, having some people uh, run from their home if they're not able to make the uh, trip in person. And uh, yeah, submissions will be uh, opening up next weekend at RPGLimitBreak.com, and then yeah. Twitch.tv slash RPG Limit Break, both for the uh, the charity event, but also uh, community uh, community marathons and tournaments the rest of the year, and then uh, uh, at RPG Limit Break on Twitter for announcements as well. Absolutely, and thank you so much for plugging that as well. And I hope uh, folks enjoy the event as it comes up, and I hope you get some really awesome submissions coming from one Thanks. organizer to another. <laughs> So, yeah, and then I guess I guess back to Legend of Mana for a, for a bit too. So, um, um, if anybody out there is interested in um, speedrunning, just speedrunning an RPG, but is intimidated by the uh, by like the length of a lot of RPGs out there, like this this run was uh, was under an hour and forty minutes. This this is actually the shortest uh, the shortest category for this game to with a dragon storyline on the HD version because the HD version does have faster loading times than the original so um so yeah if anybody's ever had interest in running an RPG I I, I can highly recommend this as a as a good kind of first uh, first good first RPG speed game between the uh, the shorter length and uh, the accessibility to both for playing it because it's on. Uh, on Steam and modern consoles, but also it's uh, it's very beginner friendly too, but but yet has a very very high skill ceiling. Because like the world record for uh, for this category, I believe, is an hour and 23 minutes, just for some perspective too, and just kind of uh, how low how lo how low this game can go in the hands of uh, the skilled runner that's um, put a lot of uh, time into attempts. Yeah, like, it, RPG runs don't have to always be these hulking, giant walls of time sync. Like, speedrunning in and of itself is a time sync, sure, if you want to get really, really practiced and really, really good. But something like this is very digestible, and glitchless runs on top of that, like, categories that are movement-based and tech-based, not glitch-based, are a lot easier to approach. So if you like this game, do consider picking up. Uh, yeah. like, you and, know, maybe and, and, the HD remaster or something. Yeah, and I guess and it kind of my story, too, of how I got into speedrunning this game, too, is, I mean, I did I played this game for the first time in full in 2006 and I, I had fun with it but I was a little disappointed by mostly by the difficulty, just because uh, this game is fairly easy casually. And then I played it again when the HD remaster came out last year and kind of had, had kind of similar experiences where I just I kind of enjoyed... Uh, getting immersed in this gorgeous looking and sounding world but was just just kind of was felt like i wanted a bit more out of um out of like the gameplay and the battle system so uh that, that, that was so that that kind of um drew me into um lo looking into the uh speed run and i yeah and i just really kind of fell in love with this as a speed game because um the uh again because of the kind of the high skill ceiling for the uh for the movement and combat but also just that this game has a lot of possible categories for speed running it and they're all very different from each other because like even the, even the other two single story categories the um the uh, fairy and jumi uh storyline runs um th those those are just very different as far as like what what's difficult about the run which bosses you fight which areas you go to even what kinds of weapons you use um, and how that plays into the uh, kind of the combat strats that uh, kind of kept my uh, kept my interest in, uh, in running this um, fresh for quite a, for quite a while. Yeah, and I was really happy to be able to have you to sh uh, showcase it here tonight. So, thank you again for being on the show and. Uh, thank you all for being here and watching this. Uh, we had two great uh, runs, one from Froob with Lost Judgment, the Kaito Files, and Puexel here with the Legend of Mana Dragon uh, uh, HD Remastered Dragon storyline. 
And of course, if you watched this on YouTube or if you're watching on YouTube right the heck now, you should go to uh, twitch.tv slash games done quick if you're interested in looking at our live content. We start weeknights at 7 p.m. Eastern and weekends at 1 p.m. Eastern. And tomorrow we have the first step followed by Victory Lap all starting at 7 p.m. Eastern. And of course, uh, this wouldn't be possible without viewers like you. Uh, so thank you all f so much for being here. We're going to send all of this energy over to another person doing speedruns. Uh, so, you know, stick around for the raid. And thank you all again so much for being here and have a great rest of your night.